Hey everybody, this is Nicholas Rogers with the All Are Welcome podcast and the Big Timber Lodge channel. This is a very exciting time for the Big Timber Lodge channel because we are live with our very first co-podcast on a live stream with my new friend Logan from the Ninja in Flannel. Awesome YouTube channel. Logan, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. All right, I'm Logan Connors. I am the, uh, the ninja in flannel here on YouTube. I've been on here about two years. I got all kinds of weaponry, throwing knives, tomahawks, stuff like that. And honestly, I'm just having a good time on here, meeting some cool friends, getting some good gear. And uh, I'm glad to be on here with the Big Timber Lodge All Are Welcome podcast, and I'm pumped for tonight. Awesome, man, dude. I, I really appreciate you coming on. We have similar size channels. Seems like you got really good success fairly quickly. We talked about it a little bit earlier. I want to jump more into that. But you seem to have a phenomenal arsenal, as you can see on the wall <laughs> behind you, um, you know, which is amazing. And you produce some great content. I think, is that a is that a lever action 3030 up there? Yes, it is. Oh, nice, man. I, I don't think I've seen that one too much on your channel. Not as much as some of the other, you know, more more modern weapons, but... Love that 3030 up there, especially with the iron sights. Um, how did you develop your style of, of, of channel? Because for, for my viewers, if you haven't watched Ninja and Channel or Ninja and Flannel, I highly recommend take a break from this, this live stream. Go subscribe to his channel uh, and, and watch some of his videos because you will crack up because he has phenomenal content, but he puts a comedy into it that's <laughs> awesome. How did you come up with this, this context for your content? I honestly couldn't be even put it into a, on paper. It's just complete chaos. <laughs> Basically, honestly, if you take who I am as a person, it's just what my channel is. Like one video, I'm shooting a, a suppressed a suppressed sub gun. Next one, I got a revolver. And the next one, I'm chucking a throwing knife. It's just what I do on a daily basis. It just happens to be on YouTube now. So what I'm hearing then is that this isn't necessarily a character you're playing. This is just who you are as a person and you're putting it on screen for people to enjoy. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. I, I, uh, I actually am the ninja in flannel. There's no character script involved. Like before I had a YouTube channel, I actually started it. I had like six months worth of content of me doing my normal crap every day. Yeah. It's, it's almost like a mix of the, the entertainment value from like grand thumb and, uh, you know, the, the, the educational, but still fun learning value from like Brandon Herrera mixed with some like early two thousands jackass, um, <laughs> with some good old Steve-O and Bam Margera, you know, that's and, and some Johnny Knoxville is, is almost how I would describe it, you know, and I love that short that you just did talking about putting parts into your gun to make sure that you take it out of the wrapper first because it won't work correctly. <laughs> Oh, that's oh, good, yeah. man. That's, that's that's comedy gold right there. Um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially into the some of the uh, the gunsmithing type ones. Even though it's useful information, it could be a little bit dry. So sometimes I start to bore myself. So I just say something stupid to make it interesting. <laughs> right, right. And and honestly, uh, do you mind if I ask what's your sub count at right now? I think I'm at. I want to say I'm close to seventy eight hundred right now. <sighs> Which blows so. me away because you're not monetized. Yeah, well, it, uh, I did a lot more shorts when I started just to learn, honestly, how to edit because I'm, okay. te I'm technologically illiterate, you might say. So just to learn how to edit, and you really need that long-form content to, to monetize. So I'm slowly catching up there as I learn how to edit and progress in my channel. Okay, okay. And also, too, like you, we were talking about some of the YouTube hurdles in order to be monetized is you have to have X amount of watch hours with now. When I got monetized, shorts weren't even like, a, a thing, but it was, uh, you know, you had to have, I forget like a hundred thousand watch hours and some, I forget what the number was, but it was a lot of watch hours. And then you had to have a thousand subscribers in a certain amount of time. Um, and now with like the shorts, I think it's what you have to have like 10 million views with shorts or something like that. Something right. crazy. Yeah. They did 10 million views for shorts at 4,000 watch hours for long form videos, 4,000 so. watch hours. That's not a hundred million or a hundred thousand. Like I said, okay. I was, yeah, same thing. But you know, it, it was kind of funny to talk about though, because you, you know, like we were, we were talking about with my channel, I've had my channel since like 2011 started posting in like 2013, 2014, actually it was 2014. And 
I did not get monetized until 2022. And I had an insane amount of watch hours, but what I was lacking was the subscriber count. And it took me forever to get the subscriber count over a thousand. Um, and, and in the past year and a half, I've kind of blown up a little bit. And I will say that that really was helped out by the shorts. Cause we were talking about, you had a short that got a couple million views, which is awesome, which I want yeah. to talk about you trolling the uh, gun tube internet. <laughs> and then I, yeah. And then I had a, and then I had the, uh, you know, a short blow up with like 1.4 million views. And, and that, that was got a good me short though. That wasn't even a troll. That was a solid short dude. Okay. I'm going to be honest with you. And I've had this conversation with my wife. I hate that short. It's well, I don't hate it. <laughs> so if, if you don't know, I'm an affiliate for nine, four, five industries, which is the tactical fanny pack crossbody chest thing that I'm always rocking in my shorts that now it's turned into like comedy. And with that one, I was like, let me do like a subvert advertisement, but make it more serious tone. And for whatever reason, people were like, Oh my God. And I'm like, dude, it's an advertisement, but it's just, it's hard to tell that it's an advertisement. Um, have you had anybody remix your stuff on YouTube, like into, into other shorts or stuff like that? I have, but it looks like it's always been accidental. Like you hear my gun shooting in background, like their cats walking across the house. Like, <laughs> like grandma clicked it, hit some button. And now she doesn't know why there's nine millimeter popping with her cat. Right. 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 <laughs> That's about <Yeah>. it. though. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah i've had a i've had a couple of shorts be remixed and i thought that was kind of cool that is cool uh, hey joseph what's up rasmussen um hey that's cool shiver me timber lodge better name idea <laughs> shiver me timber <laughs> that's funny that is that's, good that is good uh yeah so if I'm, I'm gonna try to keep just live feed being honest with you first time my i have two screens up so i have to look over here to actually see the chat so I don't have the greatest peripheral vision anymore. I have a lot of tunnel vision in life. Uh, actually, eh, my peripheral is all right. Bro. Um, if you see somebody chatting, we could go ahead and answer them and whatnot. So I'd love to be able to be interactive with live streaming yeah, chat. Look. I've never done that before. So. Yeah, so this, is my, this is my first time ever going on a podcast or going live at all. So this is going to be very fun, I'm sure. What are some of your expectations with your first live stream or podcast? Honestly, just to have a good time. Yeah. If people go on there, we can interact with the audience, talk about some of our some of our toys and stuff like right. that. That's pretty much all we're all we're looking for, right? Absolutely. And just so people know that's watching this right now, if you're watching and listening, we are recording this on the Riverside Podcast app, and we will be uploading that to the All Are Welcome Podcast channel after this is live stream. But we will be cutting the live stream short because Ninja and Flannel has brought some pretty awesome things for show and tell that we cannot actually show during a live stream on YouTube. Otherwise we'll both lose our channel. So. That doesn't sound great. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely not. Um, so yeah, let me, let me just start throwing some questions out there to yeah, you. Send it. Um, all right. So are you a family man? Yep. I am. All right, family man. Were you, were you uh, raised as like a single person as a kid or did you have siblings? So I'm actually number five of six kids. Oh, wow. Okay. That's why I'm accustomed to chaos. Okay. I love it. I love it. And how many kids do you have? If you don't mind me asking, I have three kids, a wife, two dogs and 12 chickens. So I don't mess around. Yeah. What kind of chickens are you raising? Oh, I have like one of each breed of laying hen. So you go out okay. there and there's every different color egg, every different okay. size of egg. So right. pretty cool. If they quit eating so, my grass, it'd be great. All right. So are you only using them for non-fertile eggs or non-fertilized yeah, eggs? The now the rooster. Okay. He had to be dispatched. So I, I live in a suburb of Colorado Springs and in our HOA agreement, they're like, you can have chickens or hens, but no roosters. So yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? My wife wants a uh, goat. So she wants to get goats, but Go I, I don't goats think are, her, goats are pretty uh, funny. Yeah. They're pretty funny. I don't think we have a big enough yard. We're only on a quarter acre. So like, they'll, they'll fit. <laughs> <laughs> Tie them up in the front yard. Let them mow the lawn for me. <laughs> Don't mind, uh, that's, you won't have a problem with that. But yeah, uh, yeah so uh, so yeah, I actually grew up in Illinois, the uh, oh. the, the communist core of the Midwest. But um, <laughs> but out there, it was like out in the sticks. So we had horses and goats, chickens, all that kind of stuff. So that's where a lot of my interest in these type of hobbies most likely originated. Okay, so I have a really good friend of mine, Dan, that lives out in Chicago or a suburb of Chicago. And man, we're talking all the time about like the, the hardcore gun control that's like coming across that state. 
unfortunately, because it, it looks like Illinois is kind of the 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 blueprint now for a lot of other blue states as far as um, people literally like giving the middle finger to the Supreme Court after the Bruin decision. You know, um, in Colorado, I was watching to the or watching the Washington gun lawyer today. He was talking about all 15 of the gun bills, gun law or gun control laws that are on the table now in Colorado that are very similar to what you see in Illinois. And they're completely unconstitutional. I know you're in eastern Pennsylvania. I mean, are you guys facing the same thing out there? So, yeah, I mean, if you're not familiar with Pennsylvania, like we're how people imagine Texas being like most people I know shoot. There's people that make me look disarmed. Honestly, they got so many guns and stuff like that and their skills far beyond mine. So there's a lot of that here. But uh, this year, they're actually introducing a lot of like full blown California, New Jersey level gun control, uh, mag capacity, reinstituting uh, pistol brace, bump stock bans, assault, uh, assault rifle bans, stuff like that. So they're pushing that this year pretty heavily. I don't think so far they have a chance of getting it through, but I'm also not illegal. Well, that's a, a very good point right there. It, it's, it's one of those things, you know, we, 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 I don't know. It's been a while. I graduated high school in South Pittsburgh and upper St. Clair. I lived there for a while, but that was decades ago, like 20 plus years ago, over 20 years ago. Uh, we don't need to get into that cause I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have family that still lives up in Erie, but they would be considered Democrat, right? But they own AKs, they own AR-15s, multiple AR-15s. They love to shoot. They live like out in the countryside of Erie, and yet they still vote Democrat. So maybe there's what I would consider more of a moderate Democrat politician base that you have in Pennsylvania that will somewhat uphold constitutional rights for first and second, fourth uh, amendments. I don't know though. I mean, in Colorado, we've seen, we would, when we had the legalization of marijuana in 2016 of recreational marijuana, we got a massive influx of people coming to the state to live here. And then during the Rona, we had a whole bunch of people from California move here. Um, And it seemed like California, Texas, were like the two states that they were moving from California or not California, Colorado and Texas and, and Colorado got all the, the, the liberal Californians and Texas got a lot of the conservative Californians. And they have since then turned Colorado into a super majority blue state, meaning in there's a super majority of Democrats in the Congress state Congress, super majority of, of Democrats in the state Senate, and then also a democratic governor. And they don't need one Republican vote to pass any bill into a law in our state now. Um, And and Washington, yeah, which is horrible. And it's not even just like gun control laws that they're trying to push that are, you know, off the wall. They're talking about they're not they're going to start penalizing towns and cities that allow people to build houses that are further away than X distance from a main thoroughfare of like a highway or a transportation station. Um, and the way they'll penalize those towns and those, those cities is by taking away their infrastructure budget or, or their allowance for the annual budget for road development and road um, safety. And so they, the, and the, the governor came out and said, this is part of the green new deal, the green initiative. We want to cut down on people driving cars to work, to stores, to, to travel and have everybody consolidated into one tight little area so that there's less pollution. And, you know, it, to me, if you want to live in that government telling me that I can't buy some land and then build a house on it because it's in the country, but I don't know. Sorry, yeah. I could go on. I could go on rants about this. This is all fresh in the, in the Colorado legislation. Uh, you know, so it's, it's super hot off the press. One of the big ones today that, Washington gun law was talking about it in Colorado. They're proposing that you won't be able to shoot on your own private property. It's going to hurt. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, do you, do you shoot on your own private property? Do you have a range? I do not have my own range. I legally can shoot here, but just to be polite, I don't shoot that much. Once in a while I pop a, a suppressed round or something like that, just to test something out. But like my, my gun range is like a solid range. It's 10 minutes from me, not that much per year. So I go and shoot like two or three times a week whip in there, shoot a couple mags and come home. So it's, yeah. 
for me, I don't really need to, but that's sucky that they're trying to ban people from doing that. Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 there's, we could get into more of that, but I will say like with your channel, I love watching you because honestly, there's like nobody ever out there shooting beside you. That's why I asked if you had your own range because it almost looks like you have a private range. So the uh, gun club I'm a member of, a lot of them are very funny, if you're familiar with the term. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you go there, you can't shoot too fast. People come and shoot next to you. Like, it just, it's not even worth doing. The one I'm at now, if you go in there, there's a spot that's a 50-yard by 50-yard box. The unwritten rule is if you get there first, everyone else just lets you be. And they do their thing. Sometimes if it's full, they'll come and shoot with you. You make good friends and stuff like that. But 90% of the time I go there, I have the whole range to myself. Okay. I can stretch out and shoot 500 yards. You can make a little shoot house. So I'm really, I'm really fortunate for the range that I have so close to my house. That's awesome. That's, that's, that's really cool. Can you do, well, you do tactical drills. I was going to ask if you do tactical drills, but that's, that's neat to see. We have a, a really nice long distance shooting range close to my house called the Cheyenne mountain shooting complex, which is on Fort Carson army base. Um, and it goes out over a thousand yards, but the range officers are super control freaks and you cannot do any sort of tactical drills. It's like no faster firing than like one round a second, you know? Yeah. They, they will yell at you a lot. <laughs> so um, what is, what? Well, well, okay. So before we get into like really what made you decide to do this channel, because it's just your personality. I want to know more about what actually got you into guns. Cause you said you grew up in Illinois and that kind of led you into firearms and, and this enjoyment, you know, what exactly made you into who you are today, as far as your love for the second amendment. So honestly, it's the ultimate backfire of gun control. So where I grew up out there, I remember my dad had a Ruger 1022 in the closet, an old single action, break action, 20 gauge. And that's pretty much it. I think I fired one shotgun shell my whole childhood and my dad was into guns, but you know, you're an adult, you got kids, you're working stuff like that. So you're all, you're all busy. So we move out to Pennsylvania the land of the free. And, uh, I'm like, I'm 18. We're in a gun shop. And he's like, I'm going to buy a 22 pistol. So I'm like, yeah, all right along. So I'm sitting in this crappy gun shop and I'm looking at the wall. Right. And I see a sign that says must be 18 or older to buy a rifle. And I'm like, wait a second, I'm 18. I'm like, I could buy something. So I walk right. up the counter, I slap my hand down and I go, what's the cheapest rifle you've gotten here? So they gave me this. I don't even know what it was. Actually, it's sitting in my corner over here. This garbage little off-brand 22. Like, it's this, 100 bucks. So I get this $100 22, and I start blinking. And I was feeling like, oh, this is what freedom feels like. I can shoot. I can hit stuff. Like, this right. is life. So right. let's see here. Yeah, like 11 years later, and uh, this is my life. <laughs> so basically being restricted in Illinois and I didn't even had never shot that growing up or anything. Once I got a hold of it, it was, there was nothing stopping me then. Right. Right. That's, I mean, you know, that's, that's the craziest thing about some of these gun control measures is they think that they're going to eventually be able to ban, you know, all guns and whatnot, but which they might, they might end up coming down the line. Eventually there's going to be a big fight. There'll be a civil war if they try to, implement that but you're never going to take away a man's desire to have a weapon that can go from the man to his target at a rapid pace and keep a distance between him and danger that has been around since the dawn of man when first dude picked up a rock and <laughs> threw it at something and he's like holy crap i just smoked a rabbit you know, or a squirrel, <laughs> or I knocked an apple out of the tree or a coconut or whatever, you know what I mean? And then, and then came the spears, right? And then maybe I'll throw the spear and then atlatls, which was an extension of your can, arm. Uh, to... Can we handle spears without getting banned? <laughs> um, I don't know. Oh, That's I've right seen there. your spear. I've seen it. I've seen it. Is I... that a cold steel? It is a cold steel, the cold steel, uh, the European boar hunting spear. I got to do some stuff with that. Maybe right. kill a boar. Did you ever watch that video with the guy? I think it was Jim Shockey who like hunts. I think it was Shockey. I think it was him. But he was he was tree hunting with a spear and like it. But oh, yeah. he it, but he fell and the spear went through his leg. Oh, I didn't see that. No, dude. <laughs> I, didn't see I that one. I don't know who it was. If somebody could, but it was on YouTube. He's like a famous hunter. But like he like almost bled out, dude. Like he wow. fell and the spear went through his thigh. 
So there's another wild. guy, I forget his name, but he's got a GoPro that he holds as like an extra handle. And he goes all through Africa safaris. He kills everything with a spear. That's it's actually, awesome. it's, it's pretty impressive to watch. And like, I, I, don't, I, wanna, I like to ethically hunt when I hunt. So I want to make sure it goes down. So I'm not accurate with a spear yet, right. but I could totally see myself because that's a solid spear behind me for that. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, 100%. I've seen people smoke whitetail with that thing and they get like 20 feet and they're done. Absolutely. Yeah, man. I mean, the, the spear was a weapon of choice, especially for hunting, you know, the, from the deer family, you know, that was like the stag, like back in the day, they would, for the, for the noble Kings, they would, you know, the, the, the knights and the other, the other people that work for the Kings would circle a stag and push it into a, a, a location and they would circle it. And when it was tired, and wore out, the King would stab it with the spear and kill it really quickly. You yeah. Know? It's, it's crazy. If you see footage when they drop it from above from a tree stand, it hits like a, like an arrow or anything would, but then the weight of the handle, it comes down like this and right. it'll just completely not to be too graphic, just opens up the side of the deer and it doesn't, mm -hmm. it goes down quick, which is, you know, I'm, I like to hunt now. I got into that when, as a, when I was older as well. Mm -hmm. And the goal is always to drop it as quick as possible. Cause you know, you don't want to suffer even though you're, you're har no. harvesting it. No. Do you watch Do you watch any meat eater with Steven Ranella? Uh, I watched a little bit, but not enough to be, uh, to really know much about it. Right. So he, he talks about, you know, he, he doesn't knock anybody that does archery or does muzzle load or stuff like that. And he'll occasionally do it himself. But his thing is, you know, if I'm out hunting, it's not for trophy, it's for meat. And I want to use the best equipment that is going to give me the best advantage and ensure that I'm going to have the best place shot with the most takedown so that I'm not injuring the animal and have a potential of, of having to track it or lose it. Have you ever, have you ever actually gone hunting for like deer and stuff and, and gotten one yet? So, yeah. So I started hunting three years ago okay. and I'm 29. So I okay. started hunting late. Like people hunt with their okay. dad and they learn a lot of tricks. We never really hunted in Illinois either. So three years ago, I, I, was, I got a uh, recurve bow, started practicing stuff like that. No, I'm sorry. About eight years ago, I got a recurve bow. Three years ago, I'm like, I'm going to shoot a deer with this sucker. And I'm talking traditional recurve, no sights, shoot off your fingers with a leather glove. And that's a that's a challenge. So that was yeah. my that was my badge because I'm kind of crazy. I'm like, I'm going to get my first deer with a recurve and it may take a while. So I get my stand. I'm all set up like first week of archery. This for here, he's a pretty good sized buck. He was non-typical. One side had that nice like elk type look. He walks so close to my stand, I couldn't even anchor. So I'm like bent down like this i got the world's highest level of buck fever i'm shaking and i just let that sucker fly and i gut shot him oh, oh it was terrible. sugar plum fairy yeah you know i never i can work on high voltage or all that crap without stressing tracking a gut shot deer is the most stressful thing i ever encountered yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he goes ripping through the woods he the arrow's sticking out both sides of him. he runs between two three trees and it shears off both sides of the arrow and he goes so i'm like maybe i got him good you yeah. know, 12 hours of tracking, like one drop of blood every 60 feet using search grid, using Onyx to track where I've been. I tracked him for like 11 to 12 hours straight and I finally found him. But uh, yeah, that was the worst one. After that, I went and bought a, like a, a really nice Matthews compound bow and now yeah. they go down pretty quick. Yeah. You, you, I mean, those traditional recurves, you almost have to be like, I've got a Back there, I might show that to you during the show and tell. That's an actual like Renaissance longbow, right? And like those, you're not, they're not meant for you to like anchor back and hold. It's meant to no, be you like, you get back about quick, one, two, three, yeah, and let it go. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of just learning how to point shoot. You know, it's, it's feeling, it's, it's that just knowing where to aim, you know? Yeah, that's um, cool. You got one. I actually started building them to the uh, traditional longbows. Yeah. Building oh, really? Fun. Yeah, so, I, built, I, I built a 72 inch longbow. That thing's sweet. That thing is monstrous big. I forget how long that one is, but that's over six feet tall. That's like, uh, I don't know, that's like six and a half, six, eight, something like yeah, that. I, def I definitely want to see that later. Yeah. Um, and that's made so if you ever get a chance, do you ever do like Renaissance Festival stuff? No, actually, they got a big one close to me here. I've never gone to it. What is it called? No idea. Okay. <laughs> so I know we, this one here. We have one that's not far from uh, from us. It's about a 30-minute drive, and it goes on during June, July, and into the first week of August. And um, there's, like, an actual old-school master bowsmith 
that makes long bows and recurves. And that's where I picked this one up from. So, and it's, it's pretty badass. And then they have like an archery range that you could take your bow over to and shoot it. And so it, it's fun. Neat. I've got an archery range in my backyard that I shoot that, at, but I'm not nearly good enough to the point where I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm going to try to go hunt with this. But there are yeah. people that work for him that use his bows and go hunt deer and elk and stuff like that in the woods. And I'm like, y'all are crazy. I don't know about elk. I like, I was practicing at 25 yards and I planned to hunt at 15. That buck got me messed up because he got to like five yards. I didn't know how to shoot that close to my stand. Right, right. But uh, yeah. the neat thing about those bows, um, have you ever heard of the channel uh, Kramer Ammons? Maybe. That He's sounds pretty... familiar. So this guy's got, he builds bows out of everything. He has a series called Willet Bow. So he takes like a rawhide dog bone and soaks it in water, stretches it out, laminates it to like a piece of Home Depot wood, and he makes a bow powerful enough to kill a deer. Oh, wow. Oh, he makes sick stuff. So he had a tutorial on how to build these. Mm -hmm. So I watched his video probably 12 times. I hooked him up with audience retention on YouTube. <laughs> so I watched like 12 times. I followed his steps all the way through, and I built a 55-pound draw longbow. So now oh, I'm, wow. I'm building – oh, yeah. It was solid. So I'm building another one right now out of uh, Osage Orange with a bamboo laminate on it. It's going to be cool, though. So I imagine that's what that, that is. your festival. Oh, is yeah. it bamboo laminate? Well, it's it's Osage. I think this one's uh, – this is my second one from him. I know this is Osage, but I think there's bamboo on this one. I know the first one definitely had bamboo. That's cool. So, yeah. 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 Cool. Uh, a little free note, the uh, Osage Orange is actually what the Comanche Indians used to use. Oh, really? I think it's, I like, I think it's one of the – I think it's the second best bow, bud, uh, bow wood in the world. Oh, really? Yep. Huh. I, What's point, number one? You. You. Uh, Eng English you. They call them like a you, you men back in the day. Okay. But, Interesting. Uh, a lot of flex, a lot of uh, retention, but flex. Yeah, I believe okay. so. I don't, I don't even think they need to carve it or anything. I think they just get a piece of you and send it. That's it. awesome. I mean, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, if you ever come out to Colorado during the uh, Renaissance Festival, we'll have to meet up though. And we'll go. We'll go. They have also, um, I think, three or four bladesmiths as well at, out there at three or four different locations and one of them they make it with like legit spring steel and they and they're not cheap like they're legit swords that you would use like if you were to like go into battle with somebody i 100 percent cannot go near that stand because that's what i'm missing a big stinking aragorn broadsword <laughs> yeah 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 that's they've what got, i needed life right they've, they've got all that stuff i mean they even have like um you know, Thor's hammer, but it has like a spike on it and it weighs like 35 pounds. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, they have like the big one. Then they have like the smaller ones that are, are like war hammers. And, and I was, they were telling a story about a guy that had one in his house and, and he heard somebody like break in and he grabbed it and he stood next to his bedroom door and the guy came in and cracked the dude in the shoulder and shattered the guy's shoulder. <laughs> I'm like, all right, good, good for you. Um, <laughs> They could war hammered somebody. War hammered somebody. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool, it's a fun time to go. They have a lot of good entertainment. But back to like what we were talking about with Stephen Ranella, you know, it's for hunting purposes for me. It's you know now it's about finding the the, the best gear that I can that's going to be comfortable for me to use, but also give me the best chance at success. I I I, I have a story from when back in the the '90s I was hunting deer in New Hampshire with a thirty out six. And this was back when Norma made a, a bullet projectile called the failsafe and Winchester loaded it into a, a, a like high performance, big game round. And it was meant for like elk and, and moose. Um, and the failsafe actually had a steel insert inside of it. And it was meant for like massive tissue penetration and also bone penetration. And it was like middle of deer season. It was raining in New Hampshire. I'll never forget. There's leaves everywhere. I'm out there with my buddy, Brian Case. He's on the other side of the ridge. We're both covered in like Tink 69, you know, doe urine. We smell horrible. I'm, I'm sitting out there and I'm just bleeding. And then here comes like a nice little, maybe like 110 pound white tailed buck out, you know, a little three by three. And I'm like, perfect. Right. And he's, he's like so close to me. He's only like 45 yards and he just stops, stands broadside. And I'm like, Oh, I got a great shot on this thing. And so I just, I took a freestanding shot, hit him. He dropped to the ground. I was like, Oh, I must've gotten a fantastic shot. Um, and I decided, cause I was a kid, I was like 17. I was like, okay, I'm going to take my expensive ammo out and put like a winch or a federal blue box, to just soft point in. 
And as I'm walking up to him, just in case he's not, you know, dead. And as I'm walking up, I'm fumbling with my ammo, taking out of the rifle, putting the new one in. And uh, he jumps up. And when I don't have any ammo in the, in the rifle and like, I'm trying to, I'm like stammering to try to get this round loaded in and he turns and runs and I try to, and, and there was a good blood, but it was raining New Hampshire on leaves. Ooh. And then he went down to a river and try to follow him. We tracked until the night we ended up not hunting the rest of the season. I was like, okay, I feel bad. Cause I know that deer is going to die. Oh um, yeah. But also too, I was using too much performance in the ammunition for a whitetail. Did the bullet just punch the hole straight through him? I mean, it might as well just been an FMJ. Oh, interesting. So he didn't even do enough enough damage. It just put a clean hole that probably clotted up and he took off. Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 It's actually crazy how they clot. I've even seen the big expandable broadheads. They'll be bleeding. I mean, puddles. And then all of a sudden they'll stop and you're like, like what the heck? Right. <laughs> like, what yeah. the heck? How's, there's so much blood in the ground. How's he still standing? I'd have passed out puddles ago. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But, That's why you got to hit them directly in the vitals in the lungs or the heart. You know. Oh, yeah. And sort of it's so that there's definite damage that's going to prevent them from getting away. Have you have you any desire to come out to like Colorado or Wyoming, Montana, oh, Idaho? Definitely. Eventually, yeah. I really do want. It. That's on my bucket list is to go out on the elk hunt. Elk hunt would be cool. A wild boar, that's a lot more attainable at the moment, but those right. kind of those stinking wild boar. I went to Florida twice. I'm not even convinced they have wild boar in Florida. I'm pretty sure that's fake news because I went there twice, never saw a single pig. Yeah. I, my parents live uh, in a town called Wedgefield, Florida, which mm-hmm. is in between Orlando, which is like the middle of the state, and Cape Canaveral, which is where the space shuttle used to take off. Okay. And they launch rockets on the coast, right? And they're like in the middle. So they're like 40 minutes to the ocean, 40 minutes to Orlando. And they live on a horse farm out there. And my mom, she hasn't seen the pigs, but she's seen the destruction of the rooting around that they leave. That's what I saw. A bunch of chaos, but no pigs. So yeah, yeah. I'm two I'm two trips into Florida and no pigs. I'm going to Texas next time for a night vision hunt. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. That'd what's your what's your what's your uh, hog hunting style of choice? Um, I, I've never even seen a hog, so I don't even know yet. But okay. the one but from what looking at social media, I've seen the one where they're chasing them down in like a Jeep with the top off and stuff. Yeah. That looks like just some really fun chaos. Right. Like absolutely. Their night vision with, with like an AR <laughs> and, you know, from a moving vehicle. That looks like a lot of fun. I could see right. myself doing that. That looks crazy. I just watched a video two days ago. It was a short, it was a guy on a dirt bike chasing a pig, like probably a good 200 pounder. Ooh. And he's got his right hand on the throttle and he pulls out a Glock and he's just <laughs> driving beside the pig, dumping the Glock, mag dumping into this pig with his left hand. It's pretty rad. They didn't actually show the pig going down. I mean, it was a fairly quick video. I don't know if they're like, oh, we don't want to actually show the pig dying. But yeah, they showed him like mag dumping into this pig while that he's driving beside crazy. it. Crazy. Yeah. I, I I was like, good for him for actually wanting to ride a dirt bike like that. You know, because he was drive by. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, my my friend went down and did some night vision hunting down on hogs out there. My oh, brother. He? Yeah, he loved it. He, he's got some cool photos and videos and stories from that. And then my um. Older brother lives in Texas and he does hog hunting as well. He wants to do the helicopter stuff where you get in a helicopter with a machine gun and then go yeah. mow down like a whole bunch of them. <laughs> Just declaring war on them. Absolutely, man. That, that looks pretty good. Um, what about, what about your family though? So you're married, you have three kids. Uh, yeah. Do they, do they shoot at all? Okay. You know, I'm okay. only 29. So, you know, they're True. all my like, oldest is five. So, okay. They will though. They uh they already got they're already ambushing people with nerf guns and stuff like that. So they're right they're gonna be ready to rock. That's awesome. That's cool. Um, so off, off the hunting topic, so do you do you actually um you carry out in in Colorado, right? You talked about your nine four five holsters and yeah. stuff like that. Those laws are still good there. So well, those are kind of on the on the table right now. There's um Senate Bill one thirty one, which is being proposed right now, will essentially make it illegal. This is like a Chicago thing and a New York thing. They're safe place, uh, safe zones or, or sensitive areas is what they call them. It will essentially ban carrying open carry or licensed concealed carry in nearly 80% of the state. Yeah, I've seen that. It's like anywhere deemed public property. It's like, it's like it basically in a roundabout right. way, they tell you you can't carry. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things too, where like Illinois, that has the sensitive area thing. Like even if you have a license, conceal and carry, like my neighborhood, 
is an HOA and we have our own elementary school and middle school. With the current standing of the law, I can have my conceal and carry on me and drive past the school, you know, as long as I'm not parking my car and trying to go into the school, right? That's right, a, like on the road outside the school. On the road, right, yeah. Saying? However, right. however, if they pass this sensitive area law, like Illinois, there's a chance that they will say, if you're in a school zone, you cannot have a firearm unless it's locked up inside of a box. So even if I have a concealed carry, so I have a friend of mine, like I said, Dan, that lives in Illinois and he lives around Chicago and he does like computer electrical work and he will have to drive through the city and he has to be aware because he's a very law abiding person, almost to a fault. Yeah, of, I know those. Yeah. It, but he literally will have, he will pull over his car and be like, oh, I'm going into a sensitive area. He has a concealed carry license, unload it, put it into a box, you know, a lock box and then drive through the sensitive area pull over, reload his firearm and put it back into his holster, which is crazy. It is crazy. Um, I mean, you drive around, there's schools everywhere. There's schools everywhere. Well, you it's, it's even, not even, yeah, it's, it's even not it. even, it's not even just schools. They're talking about like any place that's deemed like a public gathering place, uh, a parade, an event, uh, concerts, arenas, zoos, aquariums, public parks, which is a crazy one, places of worship, Churches, synagogues, mosques, schools, hospitals, any government building, um, and the list kind of libraries, list kind of just goes on and on and on. Oh, places that sell alcohol at a certain percentage or more, you know, and if that bill passes, then it's like, why even have a concealment carry license if I can't take it anywhere? You know? Yeah, honestly, I think that was their response to the Bruin case. It was. Because Bruin came out and they, they realized that they had to let people get concealed carry permits. Then once everyone could get that, they said, okay, fine, we'll give you your permit, but we're going to make it impossible to use. So, right. so it's, I think it's eventually going to get shot down, but it's a, it's a shady move they're taking, honestly. That's, so that's, that's a conversation that I had with one of my best friends. Cause my wife and I, um, <laughs> we, we're looking to leave Colorado because it's not a, it's not a question of if these crazy laws are going to be passed it's a question of when they're going to be passed. Right. Right. Um, and so we are looking to move to a more family friendly two way friendly, traditional value friendly state. That's, that's one of the things that we're looking to do. Um, right. Well, Pennsylvania is kind of swing statey with that. Right. So like we've got those laws there. They're unlikely to pass, but right. Yeah, I don't know about Pennsylvania. Col right now. Colorado, Colorado, though, was was like that. I mean, we've been a Democrat state for a while, but even our governor, Jared Polis, who's a Democrat, claims he's more of a libertarian than he is uh, a Democrat. But the problem with that is lately because the politics in the constituents in the major cities of Colorado have become so inundated with people from California, they want to see the laws that they fled from in the taxes that they fled from in California be implemented here in Colorado. And they are literally turning Colorado into East California. And so perfect example, Colorado said, all right, cool. Denver, which is the main, the capital, the big city. If you guys want to pass stupid gun control laws, go for it. But we're going to allow towns, cities, and, and counties to be two way sanctuary cities and, and counties, right? So I live in El Paso County in Colorado Springs, and here we're a two-way sanctuary county, meaning even though Colorado has magazine limit bans, I can still go to my local gun store and legally buy a standard capacity magazine, and there's no big deal about it. I can go to the shooting range. I've gone to the shooting range, and I've had police officers and sheriffs at the shooting range and I'm like, here, you want to shoot my rifle? And it's got a 30 round P mag gen two in it. Or I'm like, here, shoot my Glock 47 with the 17 round mag. And it, those are over the capacity, right? But we're in a, a two a sanctuary County. But one of the bills that they have proposed now is for a task force to be uh, developed. That's going to cost the, the taxpayers millions of dollars. And the task force will be sole purpose is to go to each FFL randomly throughout the state and ensure that they are only selling firearms that are legal for the state. They want to eradicate the sanctuary counties and sanctuary towns. 
So if Colorado passes, I think it's House Bill 12 or 24, 19, I think is what it is, their assault weapons ban, it will restrict all magazines to 10 rounds. It'll prevent pretty much any semi-automatic rifle, shotgun, or handgun to be sold in the state of Colorado. And then the task force will be out making sure no no gun stores are selling it. And if they find that you are, you lose your, your FFL in the state. Yeah, see, that's crazy. Because especially a state like Colorado, like you guys have so much wilderness and outdoor stuff like that. And they basically want to condense it down and make the rules for like an, an urban uh, liberal city for the whole state. I mean, honestly, where I grew up in Illinois was like that. Yeah. The, uh, the, the coyotes used to wreck all of our, our chickens and stuff like that every year. And we didn't even have the type of stuff to, to tear them, to take them out. Yeah. So. It's, it's well, so I didn't get to go elk hunting last year because we had a baby. Um, but I went the year before that. And the year before that, the best spot that I found on public land to go hunting was a state park. So it was up in the mountains. We have a crap ton of Colorado state park in the mountains and you can hunt it. And, um, you know, and if they pass the Senate bill 131, where you can no longer open carry or conceal carry any firearm on a park, I, it's the legislation or the, the, the legalese that's written into it is extremely vague. They could easily pass that and then be like, Oh, well, sorry, you can't go hunt in this area because that's open carry. I never thought about that. That messing, messing with open carry could potentially um, mess with hunting. Well, yeah. I mean, if you watch, if you watch any Joe Rogan, he had Steven Ranella and Cameron Haynes, uh, no, an archer. He was, they both were on um, the Joe Rogan podcast several weeks ago. And Steven Ranella is a renowned conservationist and he has a lot of, insiders that work in different state governments. And essentially he was talking about in a clip that the Colorado is actually has an end goal of not only banning firearms in the state of Colorado, but they want Colorado to become the first non hunting state in the United States that will not allow any hunting. They want Colorado to become a safari state as in you can only take pictures of the animals. You can't shoot them. And one of the re the ways that they're doing that is Colorado has reintroduced wolves into the northwestern portion of, of the state. And you're the, the wolves are on a no hunt list. If you shoot a wolf, it's like, go to jail. It's like that scene from Parks and Rec. You, you, you look at a wolf wrong, go to jail. You shoot a wolf, go to jail. You, you shoot a wolf's, you know, dinner, go to jail. You give a wolf a dinner, also go to jail. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You That's undercook great. the you undercook the wolf, yeah, go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great scene. It's such a good scene. Um, but it, that's essentially yes. what Stephen Ranella was talking about with Cameron Hames in Colorado is their goal is to decimate the elk and deer population so much with the reintroduction of wolves that they will in turn say, oh, sorry, you can't hunt these animals anymore because there's not enough to feed the, the wolves. And then wow. they're going to make hunting illegal. That's that's and that's coming from Stephen Ranella, who's talked to people that work for the state government. That is their their end goal. Um, and also with that, they're saying too, a lot of people that don't necessarily embrace the Second Amendment for the way that the founding fathers intended for it, and they think, oh, it's just for hunting deer, aka our president. You don't need an AR-15 to hunt deer. They're not wearing a bulletproof vest. How many times has he said that? Um, and not actually embracing the true embodiment of what the founding fathers meant with the Second Amendment. Uh, that's another end goal is when they finally ban hunting in the state of Colorado, they want to use that as a wedge that will give them the leverage needed to say, well, if you can't hunt, you don't need to have a gun. Yeah, see, that's a that's a nasty roundabout way that they've got this going on. And honestly, when they reintroduce the wolves, they're, they're, they really are playing, for how stupid they are, they really are playing the long game. Like, when they reintroduce wolves, you never would think that the whole plan was to eliminate hunting to go after the Second Amendment in the long run. Right, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's so interesting. Okay. Let's, let's talk about a theory here because Cameron Haynes, when he was talking with Stephen Ronella talked about this, it was either in Montana or Idaho. And it was an area that had a very overabundance of elk, a very healthy herd. And it was like a 19,000 head of elk, you know, herd that was on public land. Right. 
And it was like a honey pot for locals to be able to go to and bag an elk every year. It was like guaranteed, fill your freezer, you know, like American dream type stuff, right? Um, they reintroduced wolves in that environment. And in less than like a decade, there's now less than 2,000 head of elk in that area. And Cameron Hames was talking about there's now it's it, nobody goes and hunts it because you just you don't see anything. They're just not out there anymore. And Is that the same place they were talking about actually can't uh, postponing elk season for a few years to try to let them catch back up? That I, might I, be. I, I heard so, something about that, actually. So they reintroduced the wolves here. I think it was in 2022 or, yeah, I think it was 2022 here in Colorado. Guess what happened? Twenty In the area of Colorado. This is on the, the Colorado. If you go to the Colorado CPW website, they just published the big game brochure for elk, deer, bear, yachty. Elk hunting in the northwest portion of Colorado has now been greatly restricted for the 2024 and 2025 hunting season. They're saying it's due to the extremely harsh winter that we had in 2023 that decimated the elk herd. And so they need to restrict the amount of over-the-counter tags people can get to go hunt that area because the population was dropped by, I think they said over 30% in one winter. Uh, funny thing is though, that's not even the coldest part of the state. And the weather that's that, that, that hits that area travels over the Rockies towards Estes Park, where we have a massive elk herd over there. And that elk herd's fine, but it just so help, so happens to coincide that the portion of the state that now has a restriction on hunting elk is the portion of the state they reintroduced wolves two years ago. I'm surprised they didn't say the Rona got the elks. <laughs> yeah, no, well, yeah, that's a chronic wasting disease. That's another one. That's that's elk Rona is, is chronic wasting disease. Elk Rona? Yeah, elk Rona is, is chronic waste, uh, which is a legitimate thing. But yeah, it, it's crazy to see what's happening with the state. I do want to end up seeing if after 2025, if they end up allowing over the counter back for second and third rifle. Um, Cause that that's what they got rid of. And they were greatly reducing the, the areas that you can hunt over the counter now. And it just all coincides with where they put the wolves back. So yeah, that's a shame. Cause Colorado, that's kind of been on my bucket list to do like a, a hunt out there or something, but it right. seems like they're, uh, they're causing, they're wreaking some havoc on your, your whole life out there. Yeah. I mean, so the wolves have been here for years. They, they're just finally acknowledged that they've reintroduced them is what it is. And they've, they've reintroduced them publicly in the state of Colorado. Uh, there was a guy when I first moved here back in like 2013, back to the state. Cause I, I I've lived out here on and off since 2001. Um, but back when I moved here in like 2013, I think it was like 2014, there was a guy on the Northwestern portion of Colorado near grand junction that owned like a farm and he was out in his farm, saw a really big coyote across a field and got his rifle out and smoked it, went to it. And it was like, wow, that's not a coyote. That's a wolf. Right. And, you know, called Parks and Wildlife and they came out and confirmed that it was a wolf. Um, the state still denied that there were wolves here, but it was a wolf. Same thing with brown bear. Uh, there, there are still, there was a state funded thing. And I think the late seventies, early eighties, they tried to reintroduce grizzly in Colorado, but it's estimated that the, the amount of grizzly that are down here is less than 10 that are still alive. Uh, but my, my wife's stepdad, my father-in-law was a state trooper for the state of Colorado. And he reported to, uh, a family hit a, a bear in the, in the street on a highway. And he reported to it and it was actually a young grizzly. So, and then a couple of years ago, there was a hunter that was archery hunting out for elk and he was up in his stand and he heard some, uh, 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 and got his cell phone out and filmed this bear, took it to the CPW. And he said, Hey, this bear doesn't look like other bear that I've seen. They're like, Oh, that's a grizzly bear. Where'd you get that? And they're like, were you in Yellowstone or near Yellowstone? He's like, no, I was in Colorado. And they're like, that's not possible. He's like, well, I was. So they're here. Yeah. Isn't it ironic that the people who want to reintroduce like wolves and bears and stuff, they're not actually there. So yeah. you go out, you go out to hunt, you're walking to your stand in the dark and you might literally be being hunted by a grizzly bear. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 it's nuts, man. My, my uncle lives in Kodiak, Alaska. 
and the stories. Ooh. Yeah, I, I got some stories, but let's uh, take a chance. You have a lot of fans that are in my chat right now. Oh, do do you have Do you have the chat pulled up? Because there's a lot of people talking to you. I'm sorry, chat. Chat's all the way over here. I'm uh, looking at oh, this dang. beautiful man, Ninja in flannel. He's a very <laughs> handsome person. So, yeah, I'm a little starstruck. I think that's why I'm talking so much. I need to shut up and let you do more talking. <laughs> Oh yeah, so we got the, the Shiver Me Timbers for your channel. That's actually a, that's a good one. So Let's we have here. Ryan Rasmussen. Yeah, we have Matthew Connors. Hi, Noreen, Will Heights. Believe Jesus is Lord. Hey, what's up, brother? Matthew Connors. Matthew Turner says Ninja Time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Black Rifle Magic. What's happening? That's another guy. He's a good content creator right there. That dude has more suppressors than I've seen at like a you know silencer shop. Who's that? Uh, Black Rifle Medic. He oh, okay, nice. Yeah, he posts almost a different suppressor every day. I think he's an FFL, like a class That's three cool. or something like that. So living, living his best life, huh? Right. Yeah. And then we have Ruiner X88. What's up? And then more Matthew Connors, Matt Turner. Believe it or not, overcooked the wolf. Still go to jail. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Another reason I'm getting out of this bullcrap. Uh, Ruiner X88. No, I have not seen where the wolves are migrating to. Um, yeah, they're adding more restrictions to out of state hunters. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's a big thing. So I had bullets for bucks. He was my last guest on the podcast. He lives up in Wyoming, uh, near Sheridan, Wyoming. And even up there, it's becoming more restricted for public access lands. Um, but we were talking about the fact that es essentially what's happening, like with elk hunting, moose hunting, bear hunting, mountain lion hunting is they're making it a rich man's game sport. It's 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 mm. becoming extremely expensive for people that don't live in the state to go hunt. Like here in Colorado, I think now it's close to $700 for an out-of-state tag for like a bull elk if you draw uh, for the year. And that's not even guaranteeing you're going to get one. And for, so That's just to get a tag? That's just to get a tag. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. I mean, yeah. I know the, the paid hunts are probably seven, I think seven or eight grand, something like that. Or are they yeah. higher now? They're, they're, it's a lot of money, um, you know, and there's there's different types of paid hunts. There's paid hunts that are on private land, right? There's paid hunts that are on high fence. And then there's paid hunts that are on public land. The lottery is ridiculous now. It's all about who you know and not how many points you have. Yeah, dude, the lottery's, the lottery's, yeah, yeah. It's kind of crazy. Are you familiar with how Colorado hunting is? Like, how is Pennsylvania hunting? Like, if you get a license for the state, is it to be able to hunt the whole state? No, you have different zones. Like, I'm in, I'm in like, 5C, and that covers, like, it's a big area, multiple counties. So, just right. each section has their own, and then they have their own uh, amount of doe tags they release every year. Right. But there's a lot of stuff that's across the board. Like, if you get a, uh, you get your regular license, you get one buck tag that's good for anywhere, I believe, unless it changed. But, yeah, doe tags are all specific of where you're at. Okay. But then, um, but we, and we've had our own issues with stuff like turkeys that I used to see them all the time. I don't know what the heck happened to the turkeys, but they are gone. Raccoons. Raccoons. Oh, yeah? Hurt the, yeah. Raccoons hurt the turkey population. Well, we had a lot of those. So that would actually raccoons make and sense. Skunks. Um, yeah. Raccoons and skunks will hurt your turkey population. Uh, also bobcats and other sort of animals like that will, will decimate the turkeys. Now, yeah, you Colorado has what we call GMUs. They're called game management units. And uh, go to my parents' house, tons of turkey there, Williamsport area. Oh, nice. But yeah, the the map of where you can hunt in Colorado is broken up into hundreds of game management units. Oh, really? So yeah. And now typically, if you're actually putting in for the draw, you're only going to get access to one, maybe two or three GMUs. And it really is restrictive. And it's based on like a point system. So they have like percentages based off of each GMU. And so the higher percentage GMUs are the ones that you want to build up towards. And then once you have like seven or eight points or like seven or eight years in of not drawing the one that you want, then you say, hey, I want this GMU. And then it's based off of a preference system. And then you can go hunt someplace that has a very high success rate for elk or deer. Um, but so you do, so you do a fair amount of hunting, right? Yeah, I do. And and like on my channel, that's the, my favorite type of content to make is is hunting videos. It just doesn't do well. So I, right. I've i become like a Glock fanboy channel, AR-15 channel, and SIG channel. That's like what people expect to see. Um, if I make a hunting video, it could be beautiful, put a lot of effort, spend weeks on it, you know, week editing and 
and then you know it'll get like 400 views after a year you know yeah I, yeah it's funny how that goes and sometimes uh it's interesting sometimes the videos that don't get pushed very far get like the highest of uh audience retention like it's a video people really like just not that many people are looking for it like i did one on for my uh my ak here which is like probably my favorite build where I drilled and tapped the receiver and stuff like that. And like, I don't know about you, but most people don't want to take a drill to their, to their, yeah. uh, their pistol. Right. So, but, so I did a whole tutorial on it. So like the people who watch it are like, Oh dude, this is super helpful. Yeah. But it was only like, I actually think it's up to like a thousand people now, right. but uh, yeah, it does. It, it takes a little bit to uh, take off. So, so that's, that's an interesting thing that you bring up because you're not monetized and you're still making those types of videos. Once you actually get monetized or go to get monetized, you cannot do any sort of gunsmithing at all. Oh, really? No, no. Like you can't drill a hole in your, in your gun or anything like that. No. Not, not even crazy modifications. No, you, you wow. can do it, but don't try to get the video monetized. Oh, gotcha. Okay. That's cool. You can that's do cool. it and, and publish it, but you're going to, once you get monetized, you get a little section that says like, Hey, what do you want to do with this video? And you're like, I want to monetize it. Or, and then they'll be like, okay, cool. You want to monetize your video. And then you have to look through this laundry list of violations that might be in the video and then like self report. And depending on the severity of the self reporting, it'll either allow you to be monetized, limited monetization or no monetization at all. Um, but once you're a monetized channel, if you get hit with limited monetization or no monetization, they will not push your video out because YouTube at that point is not making any money off of you. Wow. So that's, that's that blows crazy. me away too with how many videos you have and how many subscribers you have. I forget that you're not monetized, so you're not even getting kickbacks from this yet. No, not yet. Well, actually, there's a lot of good companies that are, that are uh, uh, sponsoring me equipment like uh, triggers and, and stuff like that. Actually, a recent one is called uh, DPM Systems. And I haven't tested them yet, so like I can't vouch for them too much yet. But they make these crazy springs for your pistols. And like, you know your guide rod? There's a spring inside the guide rod, one attached to the end, the one that goes over top of it. So how it works is when it fires, there's a progressive spring system as you go back going heavier and heavier. So that's an example. It's really cool. Right. But like these things are like 150 bucks that you keep buying for your pistols. Like... Uh, this like my CZ here, all those little parts. A lot of companies are like, yeah, we'll send you one to try out. So yeah. I may not be monetized, but like I'm getting some, get some pretty cool stuff out of the, uh, right. just for making content and to, to play with a bit. I, I have a mentor, a YouTube mentor. He's got hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Um, you know, and he said, you gotta like, if you're going to start making, making money as a gun tuber, uh, he's like, the best way to do it is to be honest with your channel because your channel will, be able to tell when you go from being honest to all of a sudden becoming a shill um, and you can lose like your core audience that way. But he said, you got to start, he goes, and it sucks because we love to keep whatever we're given. He goes, but you got to start selling the stuff that you get. That's oh yeah. What, that's what he said is because he, he's like, he's been doing it for years and he's like, dude, I can't even keep all the stuff that I have. Oh yeah. No, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm probably gonna start doing giveaways. I think. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm doing too. So like I have my 10 K sub party coming up here soon. And I'm going to be giving away some of those uh, rapid engineering back straps for the Glock 43X and 48. Really cool design. Super cheap. I saw those. That's cool. Yeah. And they're like 25 bucks on Amazon. So they're not even expensive. So the guy that makes them is going to send some to me. I'm going to give away like six of those. I'm going to be giving away my one leaf night vision scope. Um, that's the Commander 400, NV 400. So it's like a zero to 52 or a one to 52 uh, 4K recording system. It's a cool scope, but I just yeah. don't, I don't feel like uh, downloading software and then uploading the firmware on that, if that makes sense. So right. It comes do, you have, uh, do you have normal night vision, like a, like a PVS 14 or anything? No, I need one. I need to get I one. I just, I just picked one up. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do some content with that pretty soon, get an IR laser and stuff like that. Nice. The, uh, the, the, some of the matches I shoot, they actually do nighttime uh, two guns. Oh, so really? A, yeah. I, I love shooting two gun matches. I actually have another one coming up here in March. That's awesome. But, uh, so that's yeah, pistol actually, rifle or pistol shotgun? Pistol rifle. Yeah, yeah the shotguns, I'm not huge on. I mean, I have my, my silly AK shotgun up here. It looks like a candy cane. But uh, the um, yeah, the two guns, you go, uh, it's out in West Virginia, the one I like to go to. And there's six stages. You go from like point blank, the hostage targets. You go through the whole deal. You rip through with your rifle. When that runs dry, you switch to your pistol, your backup, and go through it all. And you do everything from like hide over bore where you're really close. And then you stretch out to like 500 yards. So you're, you have to balance your rifle where oh, you wow. can be speedy and up close, but you can also reach out to 500. Wow. 
That's crazy. So it's a lot hmm. of fun, but they're going to be doing those in the dark now. So I'm, I'm going to Ooh. try to get set up with uh, with night vision and stuff and do a whole uh, nighttime too then pretty soon. Right. Now, have you seen have, have you seen the uh, the new new that's coming down the pipeline for 2024 and also 2025 is going to be fusion. So it's a it's a night vision thermal fusion. I did see that. It's uh, oh. the Holosun one. It has the like the the sensor on the bottom that wirelessly transmits it to the red dot. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. crazy. Dude, it really nuts. is crazy. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing is, 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 you know, they say like, if you don't have night vision, you're going to be killed if, if you're at night war. Right. But if you don't yeah, you'd have be killed thermal, by someone who does have it, they yeah. say. <laughs> and, but if you don't have thermal, you're going to be sh- killed by somebody that does, even if you yeah. have night vision. Yeah. So I think, I think Grant Thumb actually said that. In one I think of his, that was uh, him. Yeah. Yeah. The urban survival video. Yeah. Yeah. I, that was it. That was, yeah. I don't watch all his videos, but that was actually, that was a really good one. Dude, he's gotten steroid jacked lately. He's got huge. <laughs> yeah, he has. He used to. He used to look like me. Now he's jacked. <laughs> yeah. Now he's starting to like fill out like me. You know, it's, it's funny though, because yeah, he's gotten big. He's he's but good for him, man. His channel's really blown up as well. So I enjoy oh, yeah. his production. His production team is amazing. Yeah, so, it's, it's like full blown production at this point. It's it's like it's past like a YouTube channel. I'm just waiting for like the Garantha movie to come out at this point. Right. Yeah, I know. That was kind of like, well, that do you remember with uh, Matt Best from Blackout Coffee or Black Rifle Coffee or whatever it is? He started his YouTube channel and that blew up like 10 years ago, but he actually made a movie. They made a movie with a whole bunch oh, of really? people. Yeah, it, it was okay. I think yeah. Rob I think Rob Riggle was in it, but um, yeah, they made a movie. It had like zombies. It was a weird movie. Oh, I'm movie. sure it was. If if I made a movie, it's gonna be it's gonna be sketchy. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. All right. So so okay. So we've talked a little bit. I know we're kind of like you know squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. Uh, oh, yeah. Just kind of covering some things right now, but we're just BSing on the live chat. I know Matt says uh, loving the Warrior Land holster and light laser combo. Wouldn't we all like to take some nods home? Yes, Fila. Absolutely. Love the urban survival video. It was a good one. Yep. It was a good one. Um. Let's let's talk to let's get a little spicy in the gun community right now. All right. Oh boy. Okay, because I'm looking at your pistol back there, and I see one pistol has a light on it and one pistol doesn't. So let's let's do a little discussion about the Ken Hackathorn, you know, deba- debacle that just happened from Wilson Combat. Did you hear about that? No, I did not hear that. So Ken Hackathorn is like an OG FUD. He's very smart, OG. But he came out and said that your carry pistol shouldn't have a flashlight. I don't know about that. <laughs> Why? Why does he not want a flashlight on it? I don't know, man. You'd have to watch the the episode. We'll have to watch watch the episode. So, but so I want, what, what's what's your personal take on that? I made a video. You, you carry. I I carry, and I made a video about seven months ago. Why any semi-automatic slide action pistol, whether it's hammer or um, striker fired, if it has a traditional slide on it, needs to have a flashlight or a muzzle device. And that's because if somebody, if you just slightly push on the end of the slide and it pushes it back like a half or a quarter inch, you've taken the pistol out of battery and it's now rendered useless. So I never even thought about that. Yeah. That's that's, a solid point. I made made a video on it and uh, it did work. My flashlight actually wouldn't accomplish that. It's too short. Yeah. So that's, well, that's one of the things. So like I, 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 we we talked a little bit about what my day-to-day job is. I work defense contracting and stuff like that. I work with space domain awareness stuff, but I also work with like special forces. So down in, in Tampa, SOCOM. And we've had discussions about like there are operators and soft people. We've had discussions about, you know, what they carry, why they carry, you know, certain ways. And a lot of stuff that they carry is not accessible to the civilian market, nor is it um, a good decision for, you know, the civilian market as well, you know, to be carrying a full size service pistol on your hip everywhere you go and, yeah. Um, so like the flashlight thing for me is like everything bad always happens in the dark. Like uh-huh. no one, no one breaks into your house at noon for the most right. part. Like my dog, like for me, only time I've ever used it is, is smoking raccoons or something like that. They get in a tangle and we let the dog out at night. It's always in the dark. So like for me, I feel like any, any weapon that you're actually going to use other than just plinking at the range, mm-hmm. I'm with you. I think they all need a light on them. So like yeah. if you look, my Strybog, which is probably one of my all-time favorite guns, it's awesome. got a light. My AK's got a light, and then my uh, SBR on my left, you right. can't really see. That's got a light. Right. And then, uh, so like the one that doesn't have it, it just doesn't have it yet. <laughs> yeah. That's where that's where I'm at. Right. 
Yeah, Black Rifle Medic. Hey, buddy, you're back on. I was just talking about how awesome your channel is and how you have all the fun, fun stuff to watch and all your shorts. He says him and Masad uh, or Masad uh, Ayub are are out of times. So, yeah, I mean, Ayub? they're both. Yeah, they're. they're what would you say? The I, Ayub. Uh, I was gonna say I've heard him referred to as the king of the fuds. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. I mean, just saying. Yeah, no, dude, he's no offense to him, but I have heard that term. Right. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, I'm old enough to be considered a fud if I actually like adhered to the old ways, you know. But I'm know. not. Are you, are you semi-auto or revolver? Both. It depends. It depends on the situation. Yeah, so I got like, one over there, my, my stubby. Yeah, I've got so I've got a Smith and Wesson Model 29. That's a 44 Magnum that when I go, so I ride Harleys as well. And I do a lot of um, motorcycle camping. And my favorite place to ride is up in the Tetons and through Yellowstone and up into Montana. And that's all grizzly bear country. And so, and luckily it's all open carry country as well. And I can legally open carry in Yellowstone because of the grizzly bears. And so I've always you know, because when I'm in my tent, I'm essentially a bear burrito. And so I sleep with my pistol on me. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, that I, makes total sense for a revolver. Like, you need just a hammer in that situation. Yeah, you, you need a hammer and you need it to be, if you get a dud, you can pull the trigger and it's going to cycle to the next chamber. Mm -hmm. And then you can keep pulling that trigger until that thing's dead or you're dead, and, you know, and then whatever. But Like, realistically, how many nine millimeters is a grizzly going to take before he goes down? Pretty much all of them. Yeah. Yeah, man, dude, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's one of those things where, uh, if you have a grizzly, that's just, if you startle a grizzly and they stand up, it's actually fairly easy to kill it. They're exposed when they, when you get the soft white underbelly, so to speak, right. They're, they're, they're fairly easy. Now, if you get a grizzly that has adrenaline going and they're charging you and you're presented just with their dome and giant teeth and claws and shoulders, uh, they're a lot harder to kill. And you you need something that can actually penetrate really hard, thick bone. Like I said, my uncle lives in Kodiak, and he sent me a photo. I think it was like three years ago. It's on my YouTube, on my community tab, of a giant Kodiak grizzly inside this guy's kitchen. And so, yeah, yeah, dude. And it's dead. And he was like in his recliner, and this was like three miles from my uncle's house. And he doesn't live in like, he, he works at the sporting goods store in Kodiak. He's like the guns and ammo manager section of that section. And this was like three miles from his house. And dude was in his recliner watching Jeopardy or something like that. And heard like some crash on his garage, grabbed his like 500 Smith and Wesson revolver <laughs> and was like going towards his garage. And he's like, well, what the fuck's going on? Excuse my language. And all of a sudden the door to his kitchen from the garage, <laughs> came crashing down and like a, over a thousand pound, like an 1100 pound Whoa. Kodiak was in his kitchen and he just dumped it, like dumped all the <laughs> revolver in it and it made it towards him. Like, and that's the picture, like on my thing. Let me see if I can even find I'm imagining this. the phone call. He calls 911. What happened? I just smoked a Kodiak in my kitchen. They're like, how much pot did you smoke? Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let me see if I can find this image, but, um, way back there it's like i said from years ago um I'm oh sure. uh, black rifle medic he said he's got a he had a black bear at his range he had a black bear at his range to scare the crap out of him when he walked out one day damn well good for Woo. him good for him felis is 10 her 10 millimeters good for bear you mess you ever mess with 10 millimeter ah uh, yeah i mean you mean you know america or european 40 um <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah no i i've never messed with it i mean i've seen it i've held the guns and whatnot um, it's cool. It you know, 10 millimeter. I've heard stories about like, even the 10 mils aren't good enough to drop like a charging, um, Kodiak, like, or a Brown bear. Mm. You know, there's a reason why guides have guide guns, which are typically going to be like 44 Magnums or 500 Smith and Wessons. And then they'll also have a lever action Marlin. That's like a 45 70. And you're right. going to have a hard cast round. That's like super duper hard. Holy, how far back do I need to go? Which is crazy. Sorry. Um, I, I do want to share that picture of that guy, that, that bear. Inside. Oh yeah. That'd be cool. Oh man. So I ask about 10 millimeters. So are you familiar with the Strybogs at all? The sub -guns? talk to me, talk to me. I've, so, I've seen them a little bit, but talk so to the, me. 
So this, I have a lot of content about the Strybog. I think a lot of people are on my channel because of it. So like this one's pretty heavily modded out. So okay. they're about, it's, I think it was like 1300 out the door with the, uh, the, the brace on it and stuff like that. So they're, the, the new ones are roller delayed, like the MP5. So they, suppress, oh, really? oh yeah. So they suppress super nice. And huh. uh, mine's, mine's the shorty five inch barrel, but they just came out with a 10 millimeter one and a 45 one. Really? It's, they're pretty cool. So I like nine cause I rock one forty sevens all the time. So it's always, so my suppressor is super quiet. What are you, what are your thoughts about suppressed like submachine guns that are shooting supersonic rounds? I mean, it's going to be quieter, but like, if honestly you, you should, you shoot suppressors, right? I saw your Sierra. Oh yeah. 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 Right. Did, did it blow up by the way? Not yet. Not yet. I hope not. I, I have had to, I've had to, I have had to reapply Red Loctite. Oh, there's the photo. Oh, you moved to Red Loctite now. I did move to. So yeah, I ended up. All right. Okay. Here we go. I'm gonna yeah, so show. I have, this. I have the De the Sandman S from Dead Air, and I love it. Like I have zero regrets about it. Really. But uh, anyway, yeah. So so supersonic rounds. I mean, it's definitely gonna shoot a lot nicer, as you know. But like, it's really hard to beat shooting subsonic nine out of a suppressor. Like, I think some bows are compound bows are loud. Weird. All right. So this is not allowing me to. Wow, that's so weird. I can't pull that up. Sorry. Um, yeah. Compound bows. All right. Let me figure out how to do this really quick. Sorry. I just, oh, want, you to, I just want you to see this, this picture. Oh, I do want to see it. You know what I'll do is, well, no, I don't want to pull up our emails because I don't want people to see that. Let me just repost it. Create a post. Oh, that's a good idea. Upload an image. It won't let me upload anything that's not, or show a screen that's not on the web. So, and luckily for hmm. YouTube, I can show... YouTube videos without getting in trouble for that. There it is. Why you need home defense. All right, now go into share screen. And then there it is. Share. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Can you imagine you turn around sipping your coffee, watching Jeopardy, and there's a bear standing in your house? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's nuts. I mean, that's just death. In your, in your house right there. I mean, assuming you survive, you have the world's best story. Right, right. That's just, I mean, well, you know, I, I've yeah. thought about moving up to Alaska, but I think the seasonal depression would kick my ass too much. Oh, um, yeah. No, every winter I want to move to Florida. So, <laughs> facts. <laughs> so facts. I know, man. To if be if, fair, I haven't been there in the summertime, and I heard that's quite miserable. Yeah. That's, uh, it's, it's, so I have family, like I said, that lives in, in outside of Orlando. Um, and so there's my live stream. There we go. Okay. Sorry. Back on track. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. So have you messed around with flow through suppressors? Uh, I have not. I, I, uh, adjustable tune the crap out of all my guns. So I haven't really needed it. Fila says that spear is pretty dope. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, I have great pride in my spear up there. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we talked about that earlier, earlier in the live chat, but yeah, yeah. hopefully, hopefully I smoke something with that someday. Yeah. But uh, yeah, cool so flows through, are any of yours flow through? No, I don't have a flow through and I wish I would have bought a flow through for my shit hits the fan, my SHTF build that I did. Um, cause I purchased, I went with the Sierra five at the recommendation of the manufacturer of the rifle. He's like, Hey, this rifle is meant to be, use the Sierra five. He's like, we custom built a flash hider muzzle brake chemo adapter that goes on the end of your barrel that's pin and welded. So that's what we recommend. So I bought it. Owner, the manufacturer of the rifle is now rocking a Huxworks flow suppressor on his personal SHTF rifle. I was like, hmm. Cause I'm trying to convince my wife to allow me to drop, you know, $1,400 on another suppressor. And she's like, hmm. yeah. Now do you tune your gas systems at all? So I did, I, on this one, I have a superlative arms retro piston kit with the uh, adjustable gas brake. And it has the adjustable gas brake cool because it has denying the gases into the actual gas stem or which, the gas. Brand, which brand did you say again? Superlative arms. Oh, I was, I was just going to suggest it. Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm rocking. Yeah. Yeah. And then it has the bilge where it'll expel the extra gases out the front of the rifle. Yeah. It works so that's, really nice. That's what I'm using, but I have the retro piston kit. So it's there's no gas impingement tube now. So I'm getting less oh, gases coming back towards me. So, so superlative arms makes the piston kit. I've, I've seen that. How, yep. how do you like that? Do, would you, would you still buy that again if you went with it? Um, all right. So I've, I've done a couple, I, I did a video about it in my SHTF part two video. Um, 
unsuppressed without the suppressor. Tune that bad boy up unsuppressed. There is zero gases. There's zero overgassing. There's zero back gases in your face. I don't have like a gas blocking charging handle. It's amazing, right? But caveat, putting the Sierra 5, which is a dedicated 556 suppressor, super tight hole, super tight suppressor, does a phenomenal job at capturing gases and reducing the, you know, herd explosion. But it also means that there's a lot of back pressure in the Ooh. gases. And so even with the superlative arms adjustable gas block and the piston kit, I'm still getting a lot of gases coming back with the bolt as the bolt travels back. Now, yeah, that's the gas is tough. So a good test for the gas too. And I did this by accident. Me and my brother-in-law were kind of psychotic. So we're out shooting and it was like Vietnam downpour rain on us. And we always go to the range intentionally because it's empty always in the rain. So we'll shoot where like you tip your gun and there's water running out of your, your uh, receiver. But we learned though, if you have gas problems with your gun and you shoot in the rain, you learn it real quick. Oh, yeah. For example, my AK, if you shoot that suppress in the rain, right where the takedown button is, it will blast your glass, even with glasses so hard, it'll go up underneath. And it's like point blank with a squirt gun in your eye every shot. Oh, so rough. I learned that shooting in the rain, you realize real quick how that, how that uh, gas system's rocking. That's definitely a thing. And that's one of the, and, and I was on a website or I was on somebody's YouTube channel today and the guy was talking about, you know, his dedicated traditional can versus like a flow through can and how he enjoyed, you know, a, the flow through can a lot more as far as like gas reduction went in his face. But there were people just roasting him in the comment about it. And they're like, well, one suppressor actually suppresses sounds and the other one doesn't. no. I mean, all right, Black Rifle, I know you have some flow-through suppressors. How well does a flow-through suppressor suppress sound compared to like a traditional can? I mean, I know they're not as great, right? Mm -hmm. It's not as great, but it still does a really good job. But at the same time too, and this is what I commented, was even if you have a great standard suppressor and you're shooting 5.56, five, and it's shooting close to 2,900 feet per second or 3,000 feet per second, as soon as that bullet leaves the end of the, the suppressor, it's it's you're hearing the speed of sound being broken. You're getting that supersonic crack, and that's still bad for your hearing. You should still wear hearing protection unless you're shooting suppressed with subsonic rounds. Um, yeah, I agree. Honestly, I think you're on you're on it there. I think that flow through – I've never actually even shot a flow through, so I can only speak in th theoretically – but um, like, like you're saying, with if you're supersonic, you're not going to get all that quiet of a shot anyway. So what it really comes down to is flash suppression, like shooting with night vision. You almost like I've heard I haven't done much of it yet, but you got to shoot with a can because the smoke and stuff. So uh, it blinds you. Right. But uh, flash suppression. Now, this one, as I've heard, I don't know if you maybe you've heard this where the suppressor, if you're on the other end, which I've never been at being shot at with a suppressor. I guess it kind of redirects your sound. Like if you hear a shot with a suppressor, it kind of sounds like you're somewhere else, which or I've never, I never, I never tested it. Yeah. I, so I've heard I know, that I know Grantham did that where they sat did behind he? the berm. Yeah. They, they sat behind a berm and um, trying to get it to focus on my face. They sat behind a berm and had one of his like crew members shoot multiple rifles unsuppressed and then suppressed over their heads and they, they recorded like the audio and like the difference in the audio. And it was a different type of experience for them. That was a pretty cool video. Interesting. They did like standard, like they did like nine mil 45, uh, two, two, three or five, five, six. And then they also did like 300 blackout and like eight, six blackout. And the Ooh, one that nice. they said, they one that they said that that was like the scariest was definitely the 300 blackout. That's cool. Yeah, I just, that, I just built a cheapo one to test it. I'm like kind of toying with 300 blackout now. Right. So I picked up, so I'm going to be messing with that pretty soon with my, my 30 cal suppressor. Right. One of the things but, that I have seen though, like with the 300 blackout though, is that if you're going to be shooting it subsonic suppressed, you do not want to go with the flow through suppressor. You actually need to shoot it with a traditional suppressor because, and, and, and. Oh, I won't cycle. It won't cycle because it needs the back pressure. Ooh, it needs the back pressure. So there was there was a chick that I used to follow on the YouTube, Cotton Thrust was her name or Cotton Cotton Thrust or something, um, and she was like a gun bunny, but she used to have like good content, uh, but then it just kind of turned into a little bit too much of I, 
let's put it this way. I didn't want to be, I didn't want my wife walking in while I was like watching her content. Like it started turning into that type of stuff. So I was like, yeah, okay. it's, it's, you know, that's the worst actually. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, you know, I unfollowed her and whatnot, but she did the same thing. She bought like a 300 blackout, got like a flow through suppressor, a 300, a 30 cal flow through suppressor, and it would not cycle the rifle. So yeah, that's crazy. With subsonics. Yeah, actually, that's a good point because like I have a, I have subsonic 762 by 39 over here. And a lot of people online, and then I have a K&S piston in my AK. A yeah. lot of people online, they can't get it to cycle even at full gas. Wow. So I put my Sandman on there, which is a, a 30 cal can, and um, it cycles perfect. Oh, By yeah. the way, subsonic AK with tuned up with a suppressor is probably the most epic gun to fire. Really? <laughs> oh, it's it, it almost, I don't know why it feels this way. It feels like you're holding like an aluminum can with a couple of rocks and you're just shaking. You know, the bolts are all loose. You just hear it rattling as you shoot, and then oh, your bullets fun. are dinging off of stuff. It is a monster to shoot. Uh, it's like some Call of Duty fun right there. It is. It really is a lot of <laughs> Call of Duty fun. <laughs> that's awesome, man. That's cool. Yeah, that's uh, the AK behind me is one of those ones where I think I have as much value in upgrades as I do in the core gun when I bought it. <laughs> yeah. I, yep. I love I love the AKs, man. They're they're pretty resilient. What do you think though? If you were if you were to say I have to grab one gun. For, you know, something happens and it's like, hey, we got to get out of Dodge, right? You're grabbing one rifle, one pistol. What are you grabbing, you know, kind of in like a bug out situation? Not boogaloo, but bug out. And you right. got to get your family to a safe place. So honestly, here in the U.S., I would 100% go with my AR because if you run out of ammo, you're most likely to find more 223, right. stuff like that. I think that I, I learned this from a, he was a, a force recon sniper guy I used to work for a super cool guy, but he was saying like, if you were in a, another country, like let's say you're stranded in Russia, you're probably going to want to go with an AK. So I think what it comes down to in those situations is really all about what ammo you can get. Cause mm. when it runs dry, you've really just got an expensive club. Yeah. <laughs> but for me, yeah, for here in right. the U S my, uh, my primary SBR right here on my left side there, that's like my go-to. That's, that's awesome. I'm, I'm, I think I'm the most proficient at it. I can run it in the dark with no problems. Like, right. yeah, I think that'd be mine. How about, how about you? It's going to be a folded stock AR-15 that I could put into a backpack. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to be some sort of pistol that is common. And it'd be a, it'll be a Glock. It'll be a Glock pistol. Right. Um, probably like a Glock 17, Glock 45, 47 or something like that. Something that, that has interchangeable parts. You know what I mean? So if, if something breaks, I can easily find something else. To, That's not a good easily, point. but have a better chance to find something to fix it. Right. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. So that's my one problem is the uh, the CZP-10 is what I moved to as my primary pistol. And mm -hmm. it, it's it's like, I've been through a lot of nine millimeters. I right. love the P-10. But you're right. If, if, if crap goes crazy, you're not really getting parts, but I guess also you just abandon it and get a new pistol anyway. So. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's another big thing too is in... Also, you know, as I've got, cause I did nine years in the military and as I've gotten older and have kids and, and a wife now, you know, the, the fantasy role playing in my head of like an SHTF situation is it no longer has the allure that it used to have for me. Cause I'm like too old, too fat. I don't want to get back into a fight. Um, you know, unless I absolutely have to. I don't want to go bug out into the mountains of Colorado. Like when I was in the military in California, I had a spot picked out that was like two hours from my house that I, I knew there was like a fire road that I could break through a chain, like with my truck and get to. And there was, nice. there was a spring at the top of this mountain that had a, like it was a tiny little spring. There was like a metal pipe that came out the side of this mountain and there was just water. Fresh fresh water coming out of it. There was deer everywhere, turkey. I mean, all the animals that you could want. There was a river down there that had trout in it. It's like, hell yeah. It was like, it was like a little piece of, you yeah, know. I might go there anyway. Yeah, it was fantastic. Forget, forget yeah, bug out. Let's go now. Yeah, I know, but it's all the way in California. So, <laughs> you know, but the good thing about California is if you bug out the Cali, more than likely a lot of the people out there aren't going to have guns to come after you, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I out there with the <laughs> never mind, I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't know, man. But it's like lost its allure. So now the idea of like an SHTF situation for me, now that I have kids and a and, and a wife, is let's get to a safe place, a neutral place as fast as possible. You know, 
Right. And like, you know, I used to think buying firearms and stuff, I was like, oh, what's the longevity of the barrel, right? Oh, if it's not over 15 to 20,000 rounds, I don't want it because in a shit hits the fan situation, that I might burn through that. Now I'm going, if I have to sit there and, and have 15,000 rounds with me in an apocalypse situation, I don't want to be alive. I, I, it's just, I don't, it, it's, that's not a, that's not a place I want to be. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. Not to mention, I'm probably not skilled enough to survive a firefight that requires 20,000 rounds. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. What am I going to do? Like, it's going to be like uh that firefly. Did you ever watch the TV show firefly? No, I haven't. It was, it was a cowboy. Good? Yeah. It was fantastic. I mean, it hasn't been on for almost 20 years, but it was a, it was on the sci-fi channel back when they had sci-fi and it was like a, space western that was only on for one season really and, yeah and it was fantastic it's it's still one of my favorite tv series and there's a there's an episode where they're defending like a space brothel and yeah yeah because <laughs> one of the people that's like part of the crew used to be good friends with the woman that like runs the space bro brothel and one of the girls of the night has is she's pregnant with with one of the town mayors like kids and he wants to like cut it out of her he doesn't want her to live so they're like trying to defend this place and defend her and the baby and it's it's a great scene but there's a huge firefight and essentially like the the crew from the firefly that's the name of the uh or serenity is the name of the the spaceship they they're all posted up on like all the windows but all the hookers are are passing them guns and more ammunition throughout the whole firefight. And it's like, I'm not going to do that with my kids. You know, I couldn't so straight yeah. up Patriot. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the, the natives are attacking us. It's like, give daddy his rifle, you know, taking yeah. your 30, 30 and flinging it around. It's not going to happen. So, <laughs> so on that note though, like ammo, like some people are like, Oh, I need 20,000 rounds of ammo. And it's, it's the same argument. Like, like for me, I, this, I might, this might be kind of low. I think like the bare minimum is like, a thousand rounds of nine and a thousand rounds of two, two, three. And this sounds morbid, but my theory is if I go through a thousand rounds, I'm done or whoever I'm fighting, I've got their ammo now. Right. That's right. kind of yeah. my thought. So I love that. Right. If that's logical, but like, I feel like if I have 1000, a thousand rounds of two, two, three and nine that I don't touch, I'm probably pretty solid. What are your, right. what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a pretty solid. Well, okay. I'd like to have 20,000. So, yeah. So, okay. So we can look at this. This is, this is a, are you asking me this as an individual that's not necessarily a gun tuber? <laughs> there we go. Black rifle exactly is about a 20,000, 20,000 is about a year supply. So are you asking me this as somebody that's I not a, as him. <laughs> I know, right? Well, yeah, dude, he's putting out content so every single day. As, as a regular, as, yeah, as a regular dude, I think a thousand thousand is probably a good thing. I also think you need to have set aside enough ammo, maybe even in magazines that if you ever did have to like leave really quickly, you could, you could have that ammo and mags readily available. Um, and I, and like, for me, I look at it kind of like a uh, magazine carrier on my chest, right? If I can oh, hold, yeah. if I can hold six P mags on my chest carrier, right. With 30 rounds. And then I can hold, a, you know, and then I've got, let's say a 60 round, P mag or mag pull uh, in the actual rifle, right? Um, yeah. And then I've got my six backup on my chest. You know, six times thirty is one hundred and eighty plus sixty is uh, one hundred and eighty plus sixty is what two hundred and forty rounds. So as long as I've got two hundred and forty rounds set aside for my five five six or two two three to bug out with, uh, I'm good with that. And that's my okay. I'm not going to touch this ammo. So I have ammunition that is set aside for that. That's from Australian defense in industries. It's really good. It's some, I think it's SS 109, 62 grain mm, penetrator nice. core. It's fantastic brass. It's Looks good. Like a nice green tip. Yeah. 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 Right, yes, it, it's one of nines. Yeah. They're fantastic. Right. Um, and I have a one and eight twist in my rifle. Is it the most accurate in my rifle? No, but I can get right around one MOA. But if you've ever done like tactical drills, when your heart's really going, one MOA goes out the window. As long as you're shooting minute of man, it's it's something, you know. And I don't know if you've ever actually been around people being shot before. Yeah. I, I've, it's a different experience, right? Like, it's it's a weird experience. Um, 
So I, I would just say, you know, I think people, because we've lived in such peaceful times in this country, the fact that we haven't had a civil war ever been invaded since this country's been founded, uh, or since the civil war, I should say, is amazing, yeah. right? It's amazing. Um, right. But I, I, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I think with nine, though, too, I, I forget who said it, but I think it's an old Russian saying is that, you know, your pistol is is you, you, you have a pistol in war so that you can kill somebody to get to their rifle. Because oh, interesting. Yeah, the, that's that's the whole purpose of it is your sidearm is either your last line of defense or you use it to kill somebody to get to their rifle. Right. Yeah, my my own my own quote is a pistol is just a step above a knife. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Concealed, concealed carry not so much, but in battle, I I feel like that. Pro- not obviously not veteran or anything, but I feel like in battle, it's like even fifty yards. If you're a good shot, I can't imagine hitting much with a pistol in battle. Right. And also, too, I am a like I've said, I am a nine year veteran. I didn't serve in combat. The people that I've actually seen shot were in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, at a really seedy nightclub that I used to work at. That's since been torn down. It was called Club Matrix. It's no longer in existence. No, it was actually Rock Jungle, which was a part of Club Matrix, but it's been torn down. But that's where I've seen people shot. A couple people. Um, it's a different type of experience. So Pittsburgh but, is literally worse than the military as far as combat goes. It can be. They, well, they're, they're gentrifying the crap out of it. You know, they're they're cleaning it up. I still have friends that live out there from like high school and they're like, dude, you wouldn't even recognize Pittsburgh. Anymore. There's still oh, really? the ghetto. Yeah. Which is like homestead, yeah. but they're getting rid of a lot of the old industrial complex portions of Pittsburgh and either gentrifying that area or tearing it down and then just rebuilding, you know, modern townhomes, apartments or houses. So well, that's good. At least. Yeah. So I'm- actually it's funny. Pittsburgh was, uh, they, them in Philadelphia are always trying that crap. Of going around the um, what's what's the law called where they can't make extra laws inside the state? I don't know. Uh, Preemption? Something maybe. Yeah. We, so we have a law in Pennsylvania on the books. I think it's still there. Where local uh, towns, municipalities, and all that stuff, they can't make their own gun laws. So Philly can't be like, oh, you can't carry in our city, or you can't have mags. So they can't pull oh. that crap. Down. It's across the board here. They can't yeah. do that. So. Pittsburgh and Philly every year or so they try to do like, Oh, you can't have more than 10 rounds. It goes to a big court battle. It goes back to the, I think it's called preemption. Yeah. And then, and then it gets shot down again. But yeah, when you said Pittsburgh, they're, they're always doing that. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the opposite of Colorado in its current state. So like Colorado state law with like magazines is you can't have a magazine or purchase a magazine that was manufactured after, I believe, October of 2012, if it holds more than 15 rounds for rifle, shotgun, or pistol, right? Eesh. Now, if it was made before then, you can have the the magazine um, and, and carry it in public. But as we talked about, like, I live in El Paso County in Colorado Springs. It's a sanctuary 2A county. So I can go to the gun store and buy a 15 or over 15 round magazine, a standard capacity magazine, or a hundred round drum for my Glock if I wanted to, or whatever, or a 50 round drum, whatever it is. But there's other towns like in Boulder, Colorado, which is a very left leaning crunchy town where they have a magazine limit of seven rounds. So if, if I have like a conceal and carry and I go into Boulder and let's say I have a Glock 43 X that holds 10 rounds, which should be fine in the state. And I get stopped in Boulder and I have 10 rounds, I am over their legal capacity and I can be tried in, in the state of Boulder or not state, but the city of Boulder. That's actually crazy. So for, for us, it's a good thing because our state laws are good for you. Our preemption law would be, would be bad. It would enforce the state level stuff across all of your areas right, there. Right. Well, which is what we're going, that's what they have on the bills now is they want to, they want to have that task force that is ensuring all FFLs are, selling only guns that fall guns and ammo that fall within state restrictions. Now, let me ask you this though. Are you guys grandfathered in with your, uh, with your like standard capacity, you know, 30 round magazines, or is it like once they ban it, you can't even own it? No, they, they haven't. So that's, that's kind of the, 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 the silver lining to this is, um, that's a weird, it's a weird thing right now because what they're saying is, is you will no longer be able to buy sell or transfer anything not possess. That, not possess, but buy, sell or transfer anything that is going to be on the assault weapons ban. 
Now, the assault weapons ban is multifaceted ban. It's not just features, but it also calls out weapons by name. Our Pennsylvania one they're writing is doing that. Yes. So um, it's not just like, oh, it's features on the rifle or the pistol or the shotgun. Primarily what it's going to be is if the firearm can take a detachable magazine or has a fixed magazine that can hold more than 10 rounds. That's like the key takeaway right there. And so that's where 95% of the guns being sold in the state of Colorado will then become illegal because like even with a pump action shotgun, you can now buy those short little shells that are like this big and you can oh, load crap. that. I didn't think about that. Yeah, no, that's that's that was one of the arguments last year. They tried to pass the law last year and it didn't actually make it out of the House Judiciary Committee because they said this is too blanket. And this is going to ban a lot of like hunting weapons. Um, but now they, I don't know, man, according to Washington gun law, they've, they've got new committee members that are willing to pass this on to a vote. And so if it man. gets to the place where it has, it goes to the vote, it's, it's almost, it's like 99% that it's going to get passed into law. That is horrifying. You gotta, you gotta get, get out of there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the, the shitty part is the shitty, the really bad part about this is if it passes into law, it goes into effect July 1st. Woo. Yeah. And so, but the, the other thing that sucks about Colorado, if they pass that law, because it says you can't buy, sell, or transfer, I can no longer buy a firearm or an accessory that meets the you know criteria of this assault weapons ban. I can no longer sell my firearm to an individual or a gun store in the state of Colorado that meets the criteria for the assault weapons ban. And I can no longer transfer it. Meaning when I pass away, if I stay in Colorado, my family cannot have my firearms. I cannot pass oh, down my firearms to my family. Yeah. That's gotta go. Right. That's not cool. That's not cool. And then the other thing that they're trying to do too, is they want to implement what California did where anybody that sells guns, ammos or firearms accessories will have a special marking on like for credit card companies. And anytime that I go to a store and make a purchase, that store will be flagged with the bank. And then my, my purchase will then be reported to the state. So the state knows what I'm making, which is a registration. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Well, for a while there, did you, did you follow when a bunch of major credit card companies were doing the same thing? Oh, and they, they were they they were reporting on it across the whole country. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I that think was like Mastercard was the biggest one for that. Right. Yeah, but California just passed a law that's been that's going to be implemented where credit card companies are required to report sales and purchases of firearms and ammunition to the state. Man, that is crazy. Yeah, and then and then the other thing is too is like um, they're also proposing now that if you own a firearm, it will be required that you have insurance. For your firearm, which I've heard of that one that pisses me off so bad. And I've, and I've been telling people that damn USCCA has, is, is in bed with state and federal government oh, and they're guaranteed. going to be pushing that. So we all have to have insurance. Yeah. And then, and then they also, they're pushing like safe storage laws. They're pushing the FFLs, expansion of red flag laws, a whole bunch of things they're trying to push right now that you can't carry in like 80% of the state. Another thing they want to do too is what New York and, and California did when after Bruin, where they said you have to be a shall issue state for conceal and carry licenses, not a may issue state. Um, they want to implement that in order to get your go through a eight hour course that actually has a test a state approved test that you have to get an 80% on in order to get your license, which I'm kind of on the fence with that one. And I'll get to that in here in a second. But the worst part about it is the instructors have to be state registered or licensed instructors giving the class. And so that's what New York did after Bruin. And this is what California did where they said, fine, if we have to give out conceal and carry licenses, then what we're going to do is we're going to make it that the only conceal and carry courses people can go to are in sanctioned facilities with state registered instructors. And those classrooms are only going to hold like 20 or 30 people. And they're only going to hold class like once every blue moon when Uranus orbits the earth and a purple dog shows up on the steps of the Capitol building, then we will have class. 
And it's that's be like the DMV. It's going to be, it's even worse oh, because man. now, now since the Bruin, they are issuing less conceal and carry permits in the state of New York than they were before it. Because now they have these strict restrictions on how to get your conceal and carry license. And Colorado is looking at doing the same thing. Yeah, that's not going to be cool at all. No. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just ranting. It's, it's, it hurts my heart oh, to see this. It, it, oh, when I started reading those bills in Pennsylvania, I, I, I went and I rejoined AFA, GOA, FPC <laughs> every time right. I go and join all of them. Uh, not the NRA, though. How do you feel about the NRA? I used controversial, to, controversial topic nowadays. Yeah, yeah. I used to belong to the NRA. And then, Same. you know, I don't know if you've seen what happened with Wayne LaPierre, but he essentially was embezzling money. And he's oh, I being, knew that. Yeah. We all knew well, that. did you see that he's being forced to pay back millions to NRA members? No, no I did not follow that. And, and there's another woman that sat on the board. She's being forced to pay back millions as well. So, but the the crappy part about it is, dude still gets to keep his like fourteen million dollar gold parachute that they gave him to leave, but he's having to pay back. I forget what it is, but it's like four and a half million or something like that out of out yeah. of like back. So he's still getting like almost ten million dollars. It's something yeah. ridiculous. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I I was an NAGR member, and then I've I've belonged to some other stuff as well. Um, we have the president. Before- well, no, I think before it was just the, the whole the whole climate. Like right. before it was just the NRA that I knew of. Right. And I would join them and I would spend like what 10 or 15 bucks and they'd send me like $50 worth of junk mail. Wow. And I'm like, why don't you just use my dang ten dollars? I already joined. Right. But then like if you start researching, I have a, a lawyer buddy I was talking to. Apparently the NRA helped them write the ninety-four assault weapons ban. The owner, yeah. the owner of Ruger was in on it too with doing that. Like yeah. there's a lot of shady stuff. So I think it's better now where I say this because instead of just the NRA and all politicians, right. maybe the NRA, we've got so many other places. Like I, people talk about um, Second Amendment um, uh, lobbying, uh, what do you call them, lobbyists? organizations that I've never yeah. even heard of. So right. I think that's better. We just, we got battles in all different fronts now. Yeah. And that's, you know, you bring up a very good point. And like I was having a conversation with my wife, she's like, well, didn't the Supreme court rule that these laws are unconstitutional, you know, and it, cause we were talking about how Illinois already has three law or three um, lawsuits that they're trying to bring to the Supreme court to get them to rehear about, you know, these unconstitutional laws, gun laws that they're pushing in, in Illinois after the Bruin decision, because it's it's a direct violation of that verdict, so to speak. And oh, yeah. she, she's like, well, why doesn't anybody do anything? And I said, unfortunately, what's happening now is states are realizing th- that just because the, the Supreme Court says, hey, this is unconstitutional – States then are like, well, we'll just go ahead and pass a law that spits in the face of the the decision from the Supreme Court, and then we will just wait for it to be tied up in court, right? Because I had a buddy of mine, he's like, well, screw it. If it's unconstitutional, just don't follow the law. And I was like, well, the thing that you got to think about that is if Colorado passes a law that is unconstitutional, a direct violation of the Bruin decision, and I'm like, screw Colorado, I'm going to still have my guns, my ammo, my magazines, and I decide I'm going to the shooting range and I get some, you know, neo-Nazi police <laughs> officer that wants to goose step in line with Colorado unconstitutional laws. And he's like, hey, that gun, that's not legal. And then I get arrested and then I get tried by the state and I'm in the courtroom saying, hey, this is unconstitutional. The Bruin decision, the Colorado state law says this you are in Colorado. You will abide by it. And then I get thrown into prison for five, 10 years. Oh, yeah. And now I've lost out on that time with my family. And then finally, you know, the Supreme Court finally looks back at the case and says, oh, no, this is unconstitutional. Um, and then, uh, you know, I get released from prison, but I've lost that time with my family and my life. hundred percent. I'm sure you've seen in your comment section, the guy, oh, it's, unconstit- it's unconstitutional. Just, just make your machine gun. I was like, unconstitutional or not, you will still go to prison. You know, right. just the same. Absolutely. So there's, there's a proper way to fight this war. Right. Well, and also too, if you look at the three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial, right? Supreme court is judicial. And this is what I explained to my wife. The Supreme court does not have a Supreme court military. They can't be like, Hey, this state is not abiding by our constitutional law. We are sending out the Supreme court military to go and enforce it 
in that state. I mean, it'd be pretty badass. That's the executive, you know, that's the executive branch of the government's job is to defend people from enemies, foreign and domestic, including states and, and local towns. But you're not seeing that anymore, you know? Yeah, man. Oh, shoot. It's already midnight or 11 o'clock your time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm probably... When we get off, I'm probably I'm probably going to play Call of Duty anyway. Okay. Are you are you a Warzone player or what? Yeah, I play a little. I'm not like a hardcore gamer anymore, but uh, yeah, I do like playing Warzone. It's pretty yeah. fun. Right. Yeah, I, I like to build my real loadouts in the game and see how they do. I made I made a I made a short that was like building a load a Warzone loadout, and I got in trouble for that one. You did? How? Yeah. Oh, of Warzone. Yeah, because of Warzone. Well, I think Copyright. it was because of YouTube. I it, that got flagged. Um, it's still up. I I don't care, but. Um, but yeah, that got flagged. I also, I, I, I'm flagged on YouTube because of the fact that like over a year ago, I posted some videos of Bill Gates and Fauci <laughs> just talking and it went against the, the Rona narrative. Oh man. And I got a strike and then I said, screw you. I'm going to re-upload it. And even before it got done uploading, they're like, this is your second strike. And then Ooh. they're like, if you get another strike, we will suspend your account. And so I had to like be good boy on behavior for almost a year. And I had to undergo like, uh, what is it called? Um, Re-education for YouTube. I've <laughs> never heard of that before. <laughs> yeah. For what's appropriate and not appropriate to post on the channel. And then after I did that, I had to wait, I think it was three months before they took the strikes away. So, so I, the same thing happened to me, only it was a little bit more shady. So remember when they did a thing where they kind of switched like what you were allowed to show, like you couldn't even put a mag in a gun. Oh yeah. So I already had stuff up for like a year. Oh yeah. They ap applied that new rule, applied yeah. it to all my old videos and yeah. locked me out of my account for like a couple months. And wow. I, was like, I didn't even make a new video violating right. it. Like I, you went back and applied a new rule to my old video. That right. was messed up. Yeah. Yeah, it actually, man. it actually erased every, I, I, I really try to respond to a lot of comments. Yeah. It erased every reply I've ever wrote, written. What? It wiped every single reply to every comment from the, from all the way to the beginning of my channel. That's going to look very awkward then. Cause especially if you got into like a conversation with somebody oh, yeah. oh, and there's there, like, it, it, there, there's like 17 threads, you know, it's just, oh, it happened. That's exactly what happened. I went uh, back and tried to fill in a bunch of gaps. But. Oh man. That's horrible. Yeah, dude, there was a, I remember when that happened, I started putting a Pornhub. Um, like if I was loading a magazine, I would take like the Pornhub logo and put it over the magwell in the magazine. So you couldn't so see just it to block it. And then just to block it. And then I would put porno sounds and YouTube was like, Oh, we'll monetize this. And I was like, yeah, this what's is the matter with them. Yeah. You know, they're like, I was like, Oh, you'll monetize me having the Pornhub logo and shoving a magazine into my rifle, which you can't see, but you hear some chick moaning. And I was like, but you won't monetize or not even monetize, but allow it to be up. If you, I just show the magazine going in, it's like, that's this a is... funny test of, of their, uh, their system. Yeah. Yeah. If you I, think go... they, I think they smoothed it out. Like I, like I, I spammed them with emails. Like what the heck? Like I didn't even break your new rules. Why, why am I getting yeah. there? Eventually they unlocked me and they got rid of it. Yeah, dude. There, well, there was a guy that I watched. He was a young man. He was like in his early twenties that started off as like a lifestyle YouTuber and his dad owned like a, um, what is it called? Like a mechanic shop and they did custom work on cars. And so he just like filmed all these awesome cars and they actually developed a huge following, like hundreds of thousands of people. Maybe it was like a couple million, um, but he loved guns. And so he started a separate channel that was just him shooting guns and it was nothing crazy. It was just like a young 20 year old with like a 10, 22 shooting targets and trying out different ammo and the production value of that channel was crap compared to his like car channel. And right. during that whole time with YouTube, he ended up getting a notification from YouTube where they, they, his like handler, cause he had like millions of subscribers or something, emailed him and said, Hey, YouTube is wants me to inform you that if you do not delete your firearm channel, delete the channel, but we're also YouTube's going to delete your other channel. Wow. That is nuts. Yeah. Yeah, and he yeah. had he he had like the email, so it was like his last video on that channel, and he's like, "Hey, this is my last channel on my fire or last video on my firearm channel. It's gonna be up for a couple weeks because I'm deleting all the other the other videos off of this channel, and then I'm gonna be deleting the channel altogether." 
That's crazy. Yeah. So they must have they must have some kind of compromise because like how are like Grand Thumb and T Rex arms? How are all of them still staying? Are they just making too much money for them to mess with? Yeah, I think that that's probably it's what it is. It. It's like it, honestly uh, you're making us more money. We'll let you break the rules. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's there's a you know hierarchy there and people that are serv- above a certain level. You know, elites. And, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Um, like I, I just posted a video the other day about PSA dagger micro mags versus Glock or the uh, shield arms S 15 mags mm-hmm. and in the video. I was like, good luck trying to buy a PSA dagger micro mag. Cause the only place you can buy it is online and they're never in stock. That video, if you watch it has zero advertisements on it because I got hit with limited monetization. Man, I did not know the monetizing was that bad. Oh, it's, it's crazy. You cannot, so you cannot advertise where to purchase firearms. You cannot show websites. You can't mention websites. You're not supposed to do any sort of gunsmithing or anything like that. Um, you know, and if you do, you'll get hit with limited monetization or no monetization. And the difference is no monetization is you make zero money off of it because YouTube deems it too spicy. Limited mm-hmm. monetization is YouTube doesn't deem it too spicy, but they deem that it's too spicy for advertisers, so they won't run ads. You can still make money off of your ch- that video if YouTube premium members are watching the video, but you get like 0.001 cent per view from a premium member. It's like so low, it doesn't even- you know, So we're you- almost better off having like non-spicy monetized videos and then having just un- unmonetized ones where you get like your gear sponsorships, all stuff right. like that. Yeah. And that's, that's, so there's, there's a couple of like pathways to making it as a gun tuber. Yeah. So, uh, that's true. Matthew Turner says uh, a lot of those guys are actually making their money through sponsors and they're kind of leaving the monetizing. Alone. Right. That actually makes a lot of sense. Right. So my mentor, he got demonetized as a channel. So how you're trying to get monetized. He got, yeah, demon- he, got demon- he got demonetized completely um, almost a year ago or actually a year ago now. And he saw, because he got demonetized, he has a mentor as well that has millions of views or subscribers. And that guy was demonetized as well. And he's like, that was the best thing that ever happened to my channel. Because now I can, uh, the handcuffs are off. I'm not worried about what type of content that I'm making. So I can make the content that I think my viewers are going to want to see and not have to worry about making content that YouTube will monetize. And so he went from like a little over a hundred thousand subscribers to well over 200,000 subscribers in less than a year being demonetized because he started making spicy content with firearms. Uh, I heard you actually don't make that much monetizing anyway. No, I I might just say, screw it and stick with what I'm doing. It depends, man. It's like, if you could get to it, it's, it doesn't hurt to get advertisements on there. Um, You can make like, Okay, I have 10K subs. My best month out of ever being monetized, I made like five. New Glock or a couple, it's a good good range trip of ammo, a big range trip of ammo. Right, right, yeah. And that was that was off of advertisements, right? That was that was like 500 bucks. Right. Um, typical with monetization, if I'm minding my P's and Q's, not trying to piss off the YouTube overlords and, and make stuff, because you'll learn, if you do become monetized, you'll learn what you can and cannot post. And you'll just, you'll automatically know like, okay, if I post this video, I'm not going to be monetized. Request it regardless. And then they'll say it's limited monetized and then request a review. But typically if they come back immediately with limited monetization and you request a review, it's less than 50%. You're going to get it or actually monetized and just be aware. And this is, this is the other big thing. Just be aware as a content creator, if you're monetized and you, you, you tell YouTube, you, you unclick no monetization to monetize and YouTube assesses that video and it comes back as limited monetization. And then you request a review and then it still stays limited monetization. That video will not get the views that you're hoping it will get. And Mm. my mentor has told me this. He goes, if that's the case and it's a bomb ass video that you think a lot of people are going to want to see that a lot of people are going to be like, this is a person I want to subscribe to. He says, delete the video, edit it just a little bit like trim, a little bit off somewhere, right? So it's not the exact same thing. And then repost it, but don't try to monetize it. Oh, that's a good idea. Kind of paraphrase it. 
Yeah. Well, it just you could trim off like six six to ten seconds. It doesn't oh, have to. Oh, that's be, it. Just a yeah, little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. Like a little bit so off the front and back. So on content, do what what uh, big videos do you have planned for the future? Do you got any do you got any like long term ones where you're like, this is gonna be my hammer? Uh you know. I got one. What is it? Do you want to share it? Oh yeah, I'll share it. It's uh, I I gotta build it. So I did it a long time ago before I even had YouTube. I think actually discussed having a YouTube channel goofing off with a friend of mine about calling it the flannel ninjas or whatever, you know? So what we did was we got a big giant uh, two inch piece of PVC and you stuff that sucker full of fiberglass rods tapering out big piece of mule tape and mounted to a four by four. We were launching like, like a broom handle size thing about eight feet long. We were sending it about a hundred yards. We made the world's biggest crossbow. I mean, That's amazing. Today, I can't find one bigger on YouTube. So I want to do, a, I'm going to do a full video building the world's biggest crossbow, just a giant stinking ballista. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's that's. I think that's gonna be my hammer. That's awesome, dude. That'll you be start fun to watch. Start broom handles a hundred right. yards. <laughs> it's right. gonna be fun. Okay. So also too, this is something that I found out recently for your content. If you if you have like traditionally content that you make, and you're like, I have a video that I want to make that doesn't necessarily fall in line with what you normally make for your viewers. There mm. is a button when you publish the video. Make sure the video goes to unlisted or private first. Once it's published to public, you can't do this. But there's a button in there that says, notify my subscribers of this video. So mm -hmm. if you decide, and, and you can only click this if the video is unlisted or private and it hasn't been published to public. So if you're going to make something that is not in line with what you normally make, that but you think it's going to do really well with the general populace, but not necessarily your little niche group, you right. want to... You want to turn off the notifications for your subscribers. Oh, because they might see it and be like, what the heck is this? So that's that's what I'm going to start doing. So I want to do start doing some more uh, suppressed hunting videos like predator, oh, uh, suppressed uh, predator hunting and also prairie dog hunting. Um, and but my channel doesn't normally like that stuff, but I think I've actually got pretty good uh, film quality. In, in, in knowledge of how to make a good outdoor video. Um, so I'm going to start de-clicking notify my subscribers. Now it will be a slow crawl at first because it's a video that's kind of from an infancy. It's not being put out to all of your subscribers. So right. it, it'll go into kind of a, a generic pool of people for YouTube to assess. Do you watch any of like the social engineering, social engineering optimization videos on YouTube about how to yeah, grow your I, channel? I, I do watch some. I need to watch more. Okay. Interesting. So yeah, I gotta look into that. The notify because actually I have a lot. I have some other stuff planned. I'm gonna do the the crossbow is gonna be a big one. I need to do a lock picking tutorial. I've been picking locks for like five or six years. Oh, that's awesome. So yeah, that's gonna be totally off my usual topics. Right. But, yeah. But I'll, you probably heard a lock picking lawyer. Love that dude. Oh yeah, I learned a lot of stuff from him. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the lock picks would be cool. Yeah, I love but, that guy. He's he is super cool. <laughs> He's, he's, I, sometimes he's like so fast with it. I'm like, this can't be real. You know, you, you know how I learned it originally. I was at a gun show and this salesman's over. He got a bunch of locks and he's like picking them just like that guy. And I'm like, these locks gotta be rigged. So he like shows me how to do it. I do it. I mean, that lock opened up so easy. I'm like, I'll bite. So I buy this kit for 35 bucks. Oh, somebody accidentally locks a trailer or anything at work. Oh, I've, I've broken into so much stuff. Really? I started to real. Oh yeah, I, I can break into most 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 things. Okay. I realize if you want to keep somebody out, you got to get a combination lock. Is that what like, it is? All those master padlocks you get like thirty seconds. Yeah, broken a broken into a classmate of mine's house one time for him. He forgot his book. <laughs> broke in there, took got his book for him. So it's like lock picking is actually really easy. Okay. Yeah, my dad taught me how to break into a master lock when I was a kid, but it just involves a flathead screwdriver and a nice. That's a good one. <laughs> so, <laughs> that works. Yeah, it does work. Um, it's just, you know, the nice thing with the lock pick is you can lock it when you leave. Like it was never open. Really? Ultim well, yeah. Cause you, when you pick it with a lock, it's like a key. Oh. So when you leave, you can acquire whatever you're trying to acquire and then you can lock it again. That's awesome. Yeah. Like you were so, never there, like a cat burglar. Love like it. you were never Fila, there. Dude, thanks for the, thanks for stopping by Fila. But yeah. Um, yeah, dude, that's, it's, it's kind of crazy, but yeah, the, the YouTube journey is interesting. Do you feel like there is going to be in the near future a time when our content is banned on YouTube. Do you feel that? Yeah, but I got a, I got a plan B. I've actually meant to discuss with you on that. 
So have you heard, I'm assuming you've heard of Rumble. Yeah, I'm on Rumble. Are you are you synced to Rumble? I don't know what that means. Yeah, so I I I think Google's blocking it. Those jack wagons. So if you go on Rumble and you hit sync account, you can sync your YouTube. It will upload everything you've ever put on YouTube and just clone it onto Rumble. Every time you post, it does it to Rumble for you. None of that double upload going over there and your thumbnail really? doesn't work. Yeah. Every time I do it, Google and Google says, sorry, can't do this right now. Try later. It's been doing this for weeks. I looked it up. A ton of people have this problem. Uh, but Rumble, if we can get that, imagine taking your whole channel right. and just cloning it on a Rumble all at once. That's what we need. That's that way, I'm, I'm hoping that we're, by the time YouTube right. kicks us off, which they will someday, um, I hope that we're already set up somewhere else. Right. I, I So I have, I don't know, probably like 50-something videos up on Rumble right now. I got like 10. Yeah, I I, I've today. been uploading for a while, but I've only made like 19 cents. So it's, it's something ridiculously low. I think I have five subscribers on Rumble. <laughs> I think I'm at it's, like 14 or something like that. And surprisingly, my podcasts do very well over there. Rumble's kind of becoming the place for like free thinker podcasts. Oh, yeah. I think honestly, if we can figure out how to clone our channels over there. And actually, why don't you try, let, let me know if it works for you. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll just start a new account there and try it. But that would be a pretty solid move. Yeah. But anyway, uh, back to actual firearms. So not to change to yeah, topic no, 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 abruptly. No. Uh, so like what kind of rifles do you generally like to run? And what type of shooting do you like to do? Uh, great question. I mean, I like, I'm, I'm old school. I've been shooting since I was five years old. I like to just sometimes take a 22 out, you know, and shoot it like a can or, um, I go out to the mountains and I, I set up my own private shooting range and I have a whole bunch Ooh, of fun little nice. targets to shoot at that are like spinners or, uh, things that flip around. And I have plastic bottles that you can shoot and I'll put out beer cans and beer bottles and stuff like that. And just make my own shooting gallery. And I shoot, Bolt action, 22 suppressed. I shoot a Volkortz and suppressed. Love doing that type of stuff. So you do uh, a lot of planking, like just re reactive targets, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's cool. You know, but then I also like to shoot pistols and, and semi automatic rifles. Um, I love shooting bolt action rifles, but the ammo is just so darn expensive. That's, that's the True. hardest. That's the hardest sponsor to get for a channel. I have what, so many people. That? every day offer to send me free gear, but I can't find anybody that'll send me free ammunition. I know I've tried to. <laughs> it's good luck. Good luck with that one. So, you know, it's, it's, I would love to have like a Barrett 50 cal, you know, rifle that I could go have fun with, but I've thought about it. I'm like, I would shoot it maybe five, 10 times a year. I know I had the same thought on that. So it actually for bolt action, you know what I would, I think would be a sweet one. I actually don't even own a bolt action. <laughs> it's oh, wow. funny. And we can't hunt with semi-auto here. So really that lever action is the only thing I could technically hunt with. Really? But uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's not cool. Anyway, so I think what would be cool bolt action, and I may have stolen this concept from my cousin, is a bolt action 300 blackout. I think that would be the like ultimate hunting bolt action for Leo you know, Whitetail at least. Yeah. You, know, you, you, go two, you, probably go, you could probably hunt with subsonic for that, right? Like an aggressive 220 range. Well, yeah, and especially in Pennsylvania. So you're not going to have a super long shot. So, you know. Right, I, 50 yards. I smoke all my deer at yeah, 20 yards. Yeah, here. I mean, it, it, literally, I think, you know, the, the, the consensus with like 300 blackout subsonic suppressed is you are going to be, it's deadly out, not, it's deadly out further, but 200 yards. Like 250, oh, yeah, two, you have no problem. 250 200 yards is before you're going to start getting some massive bullet drop. And so from like a hunting standpoint, you know, after like 200 to 250 yards, the amount of bullet drop and compensation you're going to have to do computing is going to start putting you into the range of, uh, is this an ethical shot to take? Right. That makes sense. But it, it'd be cool though. Suppressed uh, 300 blackout. Absolutely. And so in Col Colorado is really weird with their gun laws on that type of stuff for hunting. We can hunt semi-automatic. We can hunt suppressed but we can't use any sort of electronic optics to assist us nor red if, dot? uh i don't think you can use a red dot no no you might be able to use a red dot you can use an illuminated reticle but i can't use like so i got the one leaf uh nv 400 commander 400 to hunt like prairie dogs and coyotes and i called cpw i was like hey i got this night vision scope they're like dude you can't use like any sort of that, that type of stuff. I wonder why. 
poachers in the dark, I guess. I don't know. No infrared, like, like no all, thermal. Like all gun control. Like all gun right. control. If you were going to poach in the dark, that law is not going to stop you. Right. And like another weird law here in Colorado is if we go hunting in a group, right? And let's say we're going to go hunt a mountainside and you are going to like go up onto a ridge and we have walkie talkies. We can use the walkie talkies to communicate about everything except hunting. <laughs> and if literally they, they have park rangers that are out in the mountains with scanners, TV, you know, com conversations. The funny thing is you could just use your Bluetooth in your phone and do the same thing. Well, you're not allowed to, so you're not allowed to use any sort of that type of stuff. Like oh, you can use, okay, get, you can use that. Onyx, you can use Onyx, but you're not mm -hmm. allowed to use electronic communications for hunting. That's crazy. Yeah, here, actually, it's a great idea. You're not allowed to track deer with a drone. Yeah, you're not you allowed to do that here. I don't get it. Like you want to, you want to harvest it. Like it's not like you're going to shoot more deer right. chasing the one yeah. you already shot. I never understood that one either. Yeah. They, they, Colorado has like, I think uh, if you fly over an area with either a drone or in an airplane or a helicopter, I believe you have to wait 48 hours before you can hunt that area. They have some really weird laws, really weird oh, laws. That's actually crazy. Right. And that was one of the things. So like Steven Ranella, he did a, he did an episode hunting mule deer here in Colorado and he made it a big point to talk about the fact that you cannot use electronic communication for hunting. Because you have to imagine the dude has a TV show, right? So they want the guy to be successful. So there's a lot of, you know, you're, you make content. There's a lot of magic that goes on outside of the edited portion that gets published, right? So oh, yeah. I'm sure if he has a TV show, they probably have teams of people that are normally out walking around in the mountains, you know, like, oh, hey, you know, three clicks to your, you know, 270 degrees, there's a herd of elk. A big eight by eight or something like that. You know what I mean? So he made mm -hmm. a big point to talk about in Colorado. You cannot use any sort of electronic communications. That's really crazy to think about. Uh -huh. I, you know, I don't, all these laws, I don't know who comes up, comes up with them sometimes. Right. Like, what, in it, like in Pennsylvania, I can't hunt with semi-auto. I'm mm -hmm. like, why? Like if you're worried about some fool, like dropping 30 rounds at a deer, they already have a three round limit for like shotguns. Yeah. So yeah, if you plug. buy your bloody three round pl uh, limit for a plug or something like that. Right, yeah. Because like, I would love to take my, my like, it'd be kind of goofy, but like my AK, it's 30 cal, it's right. suppressed. I go out there, pop a deer with one round and I'm trying to be good. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole thing is, is like, what are laws meant to do? They're meant to keep ethical people from doing things. That's all they do. Right. <laughs> that's that's so. what a law does. You know, if, if gun laws worked, there wouldn't be mass shootings. There wouldn't be shootings at schools because those are gun free zones, right? If gun laws oh, were, yeah. um, you know, when I lived in like New Hampshire and Pennsylvania, you used to hear about people that would take arrows and put them into 12 gauge shotguns and then, you know, shoot the arrow out the shotgun and into a deer and it would pass right through it. And then, you know, it's, it, it was more difficult than archery. <laughs> That's yeah. the funny part. Yeah. Have you seen the, have you seen the arrow rifle they actually make now? I have not seen it. Yeah, I actually saw it at the Harrisburg. Uh, they have a big outdoor show there. And it's actually, it's a straight up air rifle that launches an arrow. There you go. I was like, yeah, it's kind of cool. I'll right. give them that. But hey, it's, it, it is what it is. I mean, people are going to do stupid shit regardless of what the laws are, right? Oh, yeah. Um, Colorado, it's if you're hunting big game, you can't hunt with more than five rounds, right? That's that's the thing. Like you have a five round limit. So that's <laughs> like with your semi-automatic rifle. You know, if you're out in the plains or you're out in the mountains and a CPW officer shows up and you've got an AR and you've got a 30 round mag sticking out the bottom of it, the, you're going to get in deep trouble. They're going to be like, sorry, you have to get a five round magazine, you know? Yeah, but, honestly, I think that's why I switched to archery. I, just, I exclusively hunt with a bow and it just makes life really easy. Right. But here we always, everything's close. Like. Right. I think I hit, I've shot one deer at 40 yards and all the rest were at 20. Well, aren't they talking about reintroducing elk in Pennsylvania? Cause I know that they're doing that down. I believe in like Kentucky. I think we technically have elk somewhere in Pennsylvania, like up out West, like more Pittsburgh type area. Okay. I've heard we have elk, but it's like a very difficult lottery type system. Cause there's not very many of them. Okay. Wow. Okay. Interesting. That's, that's crazy. Yeah, all right. So let's just touch on this couple topics and then we'll cut the live feed and then we'll do the uh, I want to see your show and tell. Is that cool? Yeah, sounds good. All right. What do you have any other topics you want to cover during the live feed? Oh, no, honestly, most of it's for show and tell, I'd say. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> all right, everybody. We are gonna cut the live feed, but continue to record. <laughs> and so we can actually see Logan's two or three or how many ever show and tell items you have. I'm excited to see what you have. So right, oh, yeah. go ahead and shut this down and stream. Bye, everybody. 
that is dumb. So when you when this is posted, this is going to come out as a separate video. So yeah, so the, so this the live stream is going to be on my Big Timber Lodge channel. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the actual podcast that I'll be posting to like Spotify. Oh, this will roll right into it. So yeah, so we're currently rolling right now. Like I, I'll oh, nice. edit. Cool. Yeah, we're 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 still we're at two hours and seventeen minutes for recording. Um, oh, nice. Good. Yeah, yeah. You, you can just hack this little part out of this chat. Absolutely, hey, I'm going to hack out. Here, a, I forgot to ask you while we were on. Why did you name what? What caused you to name your channel uh, Big Timber Lodge? Um, so <laughs> it's a good uh, name. It's it is a good name. It's it has to do with Call of Duty actually. So that was my call sign. Oh, it does? Yeah, Big Timber was oh, okay. uh on on my call sign on Call of Duty because when I actually got into Warzone, I didn't have a computer monitor. I had a 4K 52 inch TV that I had my computer plugged into because I used to do a lot of professional uh, photography stuff, and so mm-hmm. editing on a 4K TV was really pretty. Oh, that's and cool. a big screen TV was like really pretty, but the input lag was horrible. And I also had a really shitty graphics card and like a really bad internet that I was getting like 20 megabytes per second. And so I had a lot of game lag and in Warzone, um, I was always never pulling my parachute in time. So I was always Tim the Tap Man. Oh. And so, yeah. And my buddies were like, it's like timber falling in the forest every time you jump out of a plane and so i ended up like i was like oh yeah big timber that works because i'm a bigger dude um i'm like 243 pounds. i like that so yeah so that's how i got the name it was call of duty that's awesome yeah that's pretty cool yeah how'd you get ninja and flannel other than your buddies honestly i was always wearing flannel and we we're always doing crazy ninja crap and one day i was like oh, someday i'm gonna do a youtube channel and i'm gonna be the flannel ninjas or something that's like awesome. that i just made it up one day <laughs> love it do you do you ever plan on like dressing like a- i don't know we'll find out someday that'd be kind of fun yeah, I need some more some more ninja crap, I think. Right. Are you going to do, like, SHOT Show? Oh, I don't know how to do it, but I would love to. Ne- next year, if I could mm. get into SHOT Show, I'd be all you about have, it. You have enough subscribers to get into SHOT Show now, I found out. We- I do? Yeah. And you do, too? I do, too, yeah. What's get- the cutoff? Um, so you have to, like, petition. From what I've heard, the lowest that I've heard is around two to get a, what they call is a press pass. That doesn't sound like... If I, I feel like if I was running SHOT Show, I'd probably raise that. I would too. I thought it was 10K. So I'm really good friends with Austin from Reloading Weatherby. I think he's pushing like 60K subs now. And he was at SHOT Show this year. And he's like, hey, dude, where are you at? And I was like, man, because at that time I was at like 5,000 subs. I was like, dude, I only have like 5,000 subs. Yeah, you had a video two months ago that said celebrating 5,000 subs. Yeah. Did you just get another five thousand in two months? That was that, that was that million view video. That was at one point four. Dude, that that video. If I look at that, um, yeah, I think I got five thousand subs from that two point five million view video. Yeah, I got. Yeah, exactly. If I look at that one, where was that? Yeah, I got. So two, I, I, I can grab this stuff now. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I got two right. subs off that one. So we'll start my CZP ten F right. So this is their like Gorgeous. it's their Glock right. So this is, is their F model, which is just like their monster. Like is this that is green or black. Green. Oh, it is green. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's like it's like an OD green. So this started as just a base um, green gun, you know, just green base gun. No, none of these serrations or anything. So I sent this to Jaeger Works. It's about I think it's like two fifty five. They milled all these nice serrations in it, added the, uh, the the sights in front of it, and they cut it for an RMR. Then after that, I had just, all I did was add a flashlight, and then I have a trigger coming from Killer Innovations that they sent to the channel. So we're going to be doing a giveaway of one of those triggers as well as installing the other one in here and showing everyone how it, how they, how it func- how it performs and stuff like that. That's awesome. So this is like, believe it or not, this is my, con- this is my main concealed carry gun and really? my main, con- Oh yeah. And it's my main match gun. Wow. So I want, I wanted to pair one gun that would just do absolutely everything. Right. And I probably could have gone with the C cause it's more realistic and you still get a good grip, but like, I don't know. The F's a really good gun. So, this is the first one that's like, it was a game changer for me. I've been through a lot of nine millimeters and just the recoil on it is, is super low. It's got so, a really big palm swell on the back. Yeah, of the actually palm. it comes with a bunch. So I don't know. You don't, you don't do much competitive shooting, right? No. I, I, get into, I get into some like just enough. So like your grip for your follow-up shot, like there's better videos than mine. You want to be mushed up in there. Right. You got your, all that stuff. So I realized that palm swell, it actually makes me, I'm trying to stay on camera. It actually makes me hold it the right way. Right. It's it, pushing it almost, your, it's pushing your hand up underneath the beaver yep. tail. 
it funnels your hand under that beaver tail and you get just right. perfect recoil control so you can stack shots. Okay. So I actually do like these quite a bit. I need a longer flashlight though. I really like what you were saying earlier. Right. Yeah. Uh, that happening. Yeah. Point so yeah, hand. I mean, if you want to watch the whole video, I, I, I even take like hammer fired pistols, um, you know, and it, it's the exact same thing. So if it's taken out of battery, it will not fire. And if right. some, if some, I was aware of that, but I never thought of the flashlight yeah. fixing it. That's a right. solid move. Right. Yeah. If somebody falls on top of you and you draw your gun and it's against you like this and mm -hmm. they're leaning against you and it's pushing that slide out of battery and you can't yeah. move it backwards, you can't engage your firearm. So did you discover that concept or is that from your, um, that's, your special operations That's buddies? from Soft Buddies. That is from nice. Soft Buddies. And, the, and like, because I was like, dude, I fuck. All right. We're not live stream. I was like, I really don't like the way that your flashlight sticks out further than the barrel. I was like, that looks mm -hmm. dumb. Cause I was always like, I want that flashlight to be shorter than the barrel or flush. Actually, okay. The problem is I'm too invested in holsters. <laughs> right. Too many holsters. There. Right. And, and then, the, and then they're like, dude, it serves, it serves a function because I thought they were just mm -hmm. being like, Oh, we want more lumens. So we're going to get a bigger flashlight. Like X 300 is a monster. Yeah. Like thousand plus lumens or whatever you, you're putting on that. Or, I'll tell you what, you do not want to appendix carry with an X300. I tried no. that one. How many lumens it's, does that have? It's a thousand. It is? Why you don't want to appendix carry? It sticks so far down, it will pinch things against your thigh that are not right. supposed to be pinched. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah. next guy. Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, the, the AK I've been talking about quite a bit. So this is probably the most pain. Is this, is this still on camera way over here? Yeah, no, well, it will be. So okay. the way the Riverside works is right now we're looking at two squares. Right, my face right. and your face. Uh, the way that I upload the the podcast is that the person that's talking gets full screen. Okay, cool. So yeah, that's actually really neat. So so this is my AK. This started as a um, a regular M ninety two the Stava AK, right? So this was wood furniture, a terrible brace on the back, and one of those crappy AK ones. So this started out getting a CNC Warrior brace in the back the Magpul K2 grip, and then a, um, a J-Mac handguard, which I love. And then I went with the Strike Industries um, angled foregrip. Inside, this is actually why I originally bought this one. So are you familiar with KNS? So KNS, they actually just started sponsoring the channel. They sent something out for my CZ brand up there behind me. Oh, congrats. So yeah, I'm pretty pumped about it. So these pistons, uh, regular AK's got just a flat face on your piston. So this has a, a hole in the front and vents in the side. So you can adjust this, uh, this wheel here to, to, to um, vent or keep as much gas as you want. So when you're shooting like the subsonics, you could turn it all the way back to standard. But when you're shooting supers, you can vent like 80% of the gas because AKs are way over gas. Right. And I kid you not, this AK shoots flatter than most ARs. Dang. Like, Oh yeah, it it I swear it shoots nicer than most ARs I fire. That's incredible. It's pretty cool. Well, I mean the the whole thing, you know, why he made the Kalashnikov made the AK forty seven was to make it so it was pretty much bulletproof. You know, you can't jam it. Yeah, I think that's why they're technically overgassed, but it does make them more reliable. Right. And then uh, the suppressor, actually, this is one of my biggest uh, hits on my channel. So here's my dead air. So see my wrap on here. Yeah. After you get burned and robbed by the ATF and stuff, like it's really hard. I don't know if you saw my video on it. It's hard to go buy a hundred dollar wrap that may or may not last. That's how we. That's so, how we introduced each other because I asked you about your homemade suppressor wrap. Oh, we did. That's right. So you did see this video. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. So this one, you probably watched this video then, right? The flaming mummy. Yeah. This yep. is literally just a strap. Huh. But it's it's Kevlar, so it's got like. I think it's 800 degree rating. Oh, wow. And even after that, it doesn't melt. Oh. So you'd get this strap for, I think it was like 10 or 15 bucks. You just wrap your can with it. There's like, a, I show a little process of how you do it so it doesn't come off. You put it on with the spiral one way off the other way. And it just, it works really well. That's awesome. So this, this is one of my biggest, I think one of the biggest hits on my channel is the, uh, the DIY suppressor app. Yeah, yeah that's so awesome. I, this is, a, this is a very fun AK to shoot. The last upgrade is going to be a, um, a Texas Weapon Industry dog leg cover. And it just brings a flat top rail across the whole top there. Ooh. Yeah, it'll be – I could throw a magnifier on there for when I shoot matches. That's fun. So, so that's the AK. Yeah. Uh, what you got? 
Well, I was just going to say that's, it's just fun, you know, and you can still do that DIY stuff on your channel. Even if you do, once you do get monetized, just, right. just the way that you do it is you don't have a gun on in the, in the video. Oh yeah. So like, I, yeah. If it, it, you know, I've, I made that video just the other day trying to put on the, um, shield arms extension onto the PSA dagger micro magazines. I just didn't have a gun in the no, Just, I just had the magazines and I showed myself unscrewing and screwing stuff. It got monetized. Just mags though. Yep. Gotcha. So this is the Strybog that I was talking about now. That's sexy. My flat. Yeah. There's my, that's this is, believe it or not, this is a rattle can paint job. Just regular spray paint. It took a lot of taping. It's all patterns of blue painters tape and stuff. Every time I mess with it, I put another layer on to add more camo. So the flashlight placement's not great here because it's so wide. So generally, I put like thumb on top of the charge handle. So these Strybogs, they're like thirteen hundred, where a B and T is like three grand. So they're non-reciprocating charge handle. It's roller delayed. It, that came with the nice uh, collapsible brace, stuff like that. And it's like it is really fun to shoot. I, I don't know if you've browsed through my content at all. It's very very fun. So when I go full night vision, I think this is what I'm going to outfit with like the IR really? laser on okay. the, um, on the diving board, red dot mountain, stuff like that. So this guy here, it started out with their factory lower and stuff like that. This aftermarket lower takes all AR 15, like safeties, grips, triggers. So I have a Geisley three gun trigger in here. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I see it's a flat face. It looks nice. Yep. Yeah. It's a, it's a really, Oh yeah. See, that's light. The Geisley three gun is just, it's pretty sweet. So the Strybog is like, they're, I think they're getting more and more popular because um, like the CZ Scorpion is what people know, but I honestly think these are quite a bit better. Really? What's the price comparison on them? Uh, actually, with no brace or anything, I think they're the same. Okay, wow. The only problem is Strybog's first two generations of magazines were apparently, I never had issues, okay. but they were apparently crap. Like people would crack the feed lips and stuff. Okay. So people shied away. Now, if people like the Scorpion mags, they can actually buy lowers for them. Oh, they really? Take, they take Scorpion mags. Okay. Because like that's a pretty tried and true uh, right. magazine. We'll so does that, that change? Did, so what's it chambered in then? Nine millimeter. Nine mil. Okay, it is nine. Yep, nine mil. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, it's sweet though because if you go um, like Freedom Munitions, one forty sevens. Do you do you ever shop Freedom Munitions? Yeah. 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 So their 147s are a dollar more a box, and you could shoot 100% subsonic. Really? Yeah. So wow. I shoot all 147s, and I've even shot them at 150 yards. They weren't bad. Yeah. Normally, if I'm shooting super heavies on nines, I'm shooting like the federal lipsticks, is what I call them. They have like the purple box and the red box. It's got, like the red oh, lipstick or the purple lipstick. Oh, that's like that polymer tip on them. Yeah. Yeah. But they're subsonics, but I mean, they're super. You know, super soft to shoot. So, like, if I'm shooting for can you know accuracy grouping, I'll, I'll switch over mm -hmm. to those. Just oh, so, interesting. You know, your Strybord. Yeah, it's trying to attack me. Stryboard. There we go. Yeah. Wasn't all the way on. Um, so yeah, so there's that. The other one. Now this is a project. So this is I have another CZ Bryn behind the Strybog there, a, a 16 inch. That one I'm not sure if I'm gonna keep it around. So here's the 11 inch. This is my current project. Oh wow. Uh, this is gonna get changed to a, a dead air flash hider. The handguard's gonna get extended. I'm gonna do a full like build video on this guy. I'm gonna extend the handguard all the way out to the muzzle for all your stuff. And then that K and S company, they're the ones who actually sent me an adjustable piston for this as well. So this gets three three primary positions, and then oh, the wow. end twist, and it's got 13 like micro adjustments. Oh so wow! You can, like really yeah. dial it in. You could really dial it in, and then the handguard that goes over it has windows in the side. So you can still grab, reach your fingers in and grab it. Okay. What is that so chambered in? Five five six. Oh, it is five five six. Yep. And this is an uh, an eleven five barrel. Okay. So these have you, have you ever shot one of these the brands? No, no, I have not. So check this out. I like it. I think they're slightly nicer than like a scar. Okay. I'm gonna piss some people off, but I like them better. So you've got a side charging handle. Right. But the a neat thing is your bolt release. You have um, a regular AR style one. You can hit the charge handle. They have one inside the trigger guard. Really? So you literally just push it down from, with your finger, and then you can fire. That's it. pretty cool. They're pretty neat. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of, we'll see if it's going to be something I hang on to, but as an experiment so far, like, these brands are really nice. Have you do you, have you messed around with, like, any Bear Creek Arsenal stuff? Um, like, like for building ARs? Yeah. I have not. 
Actually, you know, I think I did get a barrel from them once. So they they will sponsor your or not sponsor your channel, but they will pick you up if you run like their gear. Now, just be aware, anything Bear Creek Arsenal does not get monetized, and you get very low views, and it's very cheap gear. So don't try to like if if I just well, 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 I think it's because they're only sold online. Interesting. So it's it's like literally I just can say. Oh, I'm doing a video on Bear Creek Arsenal. And then all of a sudden, it's just every video that I have posted with Bear Creek Arsenal is not monetized. Really? Like yeah. it officially won't monetize? It's limited monetization. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. But I, I, I leave it up there because I, I did reviews because they send me free gear. If I'm making something just for myself that I spend the money on, I want the video to get monetized. And, oh, yeah. And I will do whatever it takes to get it monetized if I'm wasting the money. Or not waste them, but if I'm burning through my own cash, if somebody oh, yeah, sends me, if somebody sends me something, that's your payment. That's that's my payment, right? And whether it gets monetized or it doesn't, that's not up to me. If I make the video and it doesn't get monetized, sorry, but I let you know, hey, I made your video. Here you go. Um, but it doesn't really affect them if it gets monetized. Bear no, Creek. they just want they just want to have the more that the, the more exposure and and way YouTube works is the more that a name is in the title of of something the more likely it's going to pop up for that category that it falls under. So if people now, do you, are, do you like Bear Creek Arsenal so far? Yeah. But the reason why I brought it up is they have, I have a uh, 300 blackout upper from them. And then I have a AR 15, five, five, six or two, two, three, wildy wild um, okay, yeah. upper. And the two, two, three upper actually has a right side charging handle. Oh, interesting. So that's why I was, cause I, I know you like your AK 47, but yeah, I it has a, it has a right side charging handle, and so when I'm on it, I actually treat it like an AK. So I reach up underneath and just charge this way. That's really funny. Yeah. So uh, so how do you like to build out your primary AR? So mine, I gotta move my mic again. Um, so mine, this is my primary SBR. I get on the in this frame. So I've got like a light on the the one o'clock here. Mm -hmm. I do a, a push button on the side, like when you shoot for recoil, you put your thumb on top. Mm -hmm. I realized when I had it like that, my light was on the whole time I was shooting all the time. So I moved to the side and then I run a, uh, a three power magnifier and a primary arms SLX, which have you try these. I have not. Are they nice? Are, oh, they're super nice. They have yeah. a, a Chevron instead of a dot. Oh, I like the Chevron. And then, yeah, the Chevron's nice. There's a ranging reticle in the bottom mm -hmm. and there's a chart they give you. So like your Chevron, the tip is like a hundred right in the top of like right in the V part is 300, I think. And then the feet are 400. Wow. Okay. So when there's, you go out, you've got your own little system to where awesome. your shopping is going to be. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. I, I, my like primary one. So I, I've quite a few ARs, right? Um, yeah. if, if something goes down, I'm grabbing my blackout defense. So, right. and it's got a lot of tactical folder on it. And then it, on top of it is a night force attacker one to eight. And do, then, you, uh, do, you, do you like the folder? Do you, do you trust it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't sure if it would create a weak point if, or if it was pretty solid. They look it's, nice. They're solid. They're, they're solid. So the, 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 the issue that you have with the folder is that um, if it's folded open, you have to be aware of the fact that there's on the rear of the bolt is an extension. That's like this long that plugs into, yeah, the, I've seen that, that that little plugs like into the back. Plunger. Yeah. It's like a plunger that plugs into the back of the bolt carrier group or the bolt so that, or no, the BCG, um, because the law tactical folder increases the distance from the rear of the upper receiver to the actual buffer tube by about this much. Mm, and oh, it's like a spacer. It's a spacer because if you don't have that spacer in there, then when you pull the trigger, you're, Bolt carrier group is going to be flying rearward without any contact with the actual buffer for this much distance, and it could right next to your face, and it could explode. Whoa! So you have to have that spacer in the rear of the bolt carrier group. Now, when it's open, there's a little latch thing that comes up that prevents the spacer from sliding out. Now, if that latch thing is down, you easily could just grab it and slide it right out. There is no, it doesn't screw into the rear of your bolt carrier assembly. Mm. And so therefore, if you have it folded up in like a bag, and let's say you've got some magazines or gear nods 
whatever. Something to let it loose. Something that accidentally is in the bottom of the bag and pushes up against that little lever and that little plunger falls out or that spacer and then you shut it and then you go to shoot it. Now you're you're in you potentially deep shit, right? Now, do, uh, have you ever had it fall out in your bag? No, I haven't. So, so that sounds to me like Law should build a um, their own uh, bolt carrier. Right. That's with an ext- extended rear. That'd be right. cool. That would be really cool. Either, yeah, create like their own bolt carrier group with an extended rear, or Make a threaded that takes the the plunger into it, something like that. Absolutely. That's exactly. That'd be pretty neat. That would be that would be my guess. Is first is just create a bolt carrier group that or a bolt carrier that has threading, and you could screw the plunger into the rear. Um, that would be my my thing. But I think honestly, the best part, I think the best thing is what you said is to actually just create a bolt carrier that is longer. That makes sense. I mean, right. that, then you get in the proprietary parts, which kind of sucks, right. but yeah. that would be cool. Like so I could, I, I couldn't use my superlative arms retro piston kit because you have to use the superlative arms bolt for mm. or the bolt carrier because um, it doesn't have the gas impingement hole. It's flat so that the piston rod can push against it. Oh, you know what they could do? Because the back of the uh, carrier is round. Are you familiar with like a uh, a pipe plug or duct plugged plug? Mm-mm. You stick in like a, a PVC pipe and you spin the little wing nut. Oh, it, yeah. It, uh, in. They ex- yeah. They need a fancier version of that in the back of your bolt carrier. Right. Imagine that plunger would actually thread in, like, would cinch into it. That'd be kind right. of interesting. Yeah. Another thing that you could do too, if they, you didn't. They if, could do it. They could do it. Another thing you could do too is like, and I've talked to my, my gunsmith about it. You could, you could have the the rear portion of the bolt carrier pin and welded to the actual plug itself. Oh, that honestly, that's probably the best solution and the strongest. Yeah. All right. So last one. So this is my beater. This is like the first AR I built. Nice. It's probably five or 600 bucks out the door. Yeah. Um, I will say why I should even show this, that people like to snub the beaters, but they do some work. Like yeah. Bear Creek is like, that's pretty, uh, pretty budget level, right? Yeah. You can get a fully built, AR-15 for 380 bucks right now. Oh, wow. That's even cheaper. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is like my five or $600 build, inc- maybe including the red dot. I've spray painted it probably eight times. Wow. May or may not have stripped it each time. <laughs> like it's got more, it's like getting thicker at this point. Oh, yeah. And it runs like a champ. So that's awesome. right now this is like, this is like my trash can paint job. It's just a little of everything. Oh, so the beater that. AR, I... They're not terrible. Like a new new gun owners, I have no problem telling them like, yeah, just build a beater to start. You don't need a knight's right. armament as your first AR. No, definitely not. My buddy, my buddy that was one of he's still one of my best friends moved from here to North Carolina, and when he got to North Carolina, he's like, dude, I feel like I need a handgun and a rifle. And I said, exactly what you need. I got I hook you up, buddy. I said, get the Bear Creek Arsenal. Right, we'll get it less than four hundred dollars. He doesn't have sights for it yet. I'm about to just send them some flip up irons to put on there. I bought people so many sites. Like, ah, I'll get sites later. I'm yeah. like, you, know, you, you need sites now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then I was like, get a PSA dagger. Cause he's, he's taller. Yeah. He's like six foot three. He has bigger hands. I was like, dude, get a PSA dagger. And there you go. Is PSA that what that is? My, yep. The guy uh, kind of got in part of a trade deal. Nice. The, uh, yeah. It's, I think it's gonna be my wife's gun. It actually, honestly, it's a pretty solid little pistol. These daggers. Mm-hmm. I don't think I would pick this barrel color personally, mm-hmm. but it's pretty pretty social media flashy. You know what I mean? Right, right. I don't but know. How man. do you feel about how do you feel about red dots and pistols? Uh, I love them now. I mean, I didn't I didn't actually start rocking them until last year. So I've same. always actually same. Yeah, I was I've always been so I've been shooting shotguns since I was five. <sighs> Started shooting rifle around nine. And then started shooting pistol probably when I was around 11, right? And I've I've grown up that way, but it was more traditional style stuff that I was shooting. My first semi-automatic pistol that I bought myself, not a revolver, but a pistol, was an H&K P30 chambered in 40 cal. Ooh. Nice. Yeah, but it has the LEM-1 trigger on it, so it's a really smooth trigger, but the trigger pull on it is like forever. Like the trigger pull is forever and it's the reset is forever to the point where I used to do tactical drills with it. And there'd be so many times I'd be getting into the mode. And then all of a sudden I'm like trying to pull the trigger and nothing's happening. Cause I had, oh, wow. I didn't let up on the reset enough. I do the it's same like, thing with SIGs. It's like, it's like my SKS trigger. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, but yeah, no, I finally, once I started the YouTube stuff, I finally started having people reach out to me and they're like, Hey, do we want to send you some red dots to try out some cheap Chinese stuff? And I was like, cool, let me, let me go ahead and try this out. And, um, so I started putting them on like pistols to try and then I'd give them away. I'd do giveaways. I'd, I would, my thing is, is typically, 100%. typically if I get something from China, I test it and then give it away. Uh, there's yeah. one, there's one thing that I haven't given away and it's on my SIG P365 TAC Ops, which is a Sealy Cat Pro. And it's an armored red dot, has a really big window. It's a three MOA dot. It holds zero very well. And That's- yeah, and it's got good shake awake technology and it's IPS seven. And in the review video, I actually submerged it in water multiple times and, hmm. then, and then took it to the range shot it and then i didn't clean it for three days and then i cleaned it and then it, no issues so i'm like all right that's, that's such an interesting yeah so like my problem is like my cz has an rmr on it my yeah. dagger's got a uh a hollow sun 507c i hate to admit it because it shouldn't be this way but i like the hollow sun a lot better like hands down the glass is nicer the mm-hmm. reticles nicer but the question is like will it survive next to an rmr that's a that's a great question. So I actually that's have a question. that's a good question. I so on my rifle, on my like SHTF rifle, I, I have the attacker one to eight on the top mount, and then it's mounted with a uh, Badger Ordnance uh, Condition One scope mount, and then that also has a forty five degree cant off the right towards the front of the mount. So in front of the ejection chamber for my AR fifteen, and on that I have a Trigicon RMR mounted there. So oh, nice. I have that sided in for like 20 to 25 yards, the RMR. And then I have my attacker sided in for a hundred yards and it's got a true horse reticle. So I can, since it's dialed in at a hundred, I could take it out to, you know, 600 yards. That's but, really nice. Yeah. And, and I love that the Trigicon RMR is very resilient though. I will say like, I trust that more than I trust my several other, red dots that I have from China. Yeah. Oh yeah. That, that That's my problem of why I, I, it's hard to switch out to the hollow sun, even though I like it better. It's just, will it survive? To be fair, I have backup sights on it too. The right. irons. Right. So it's not the end of the world. Right. But that's, that's yeah. the whole thing is, is, is I think a lot of the guns that I have for a while, whenever I'd want to build them out, I wanted to build everything out to top tier, you know, completely survive a nuclear blast type type stuff. And then I finally started to realize like, hey, I really only need to be spending that kind of money on like one or two guns that are going to oh, go yeah. with me. Um, 100%. You know, I don't like to be the it's just as nice as guy. Right. But like you got to know what you need, what your budget is. Right. Like you're not going to carry six rifles. So build one good gun and a bunch of toys. Absolutely. Absolutely. And find out what you like. Try different things. The thing that I love about my Trigicon RMR that I wish the Sealy Cat Pro had and I, I wish the Cat Pro – I wish – for, and this is one thing I will say to your viewers and my viewers if they're watching this podcast, is for a red dot on a pistol, they now have adaptive lighting. So what that means is you choose the brightness of your red dot that you like in any setting, and then you can program it to your red dot. And there's, a, and there's a and there's and there's a photo sensor on the actual red dot itself. So if you have your 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 pistol and you're practicing in a very well illuminated range or you're outdoors during the day and you have it cranked up to nine out of ten for daylight bright, and mm-hmm. all of a sudden you're in a movie theater or you're walking to your car and you pull your your pistol out. And on comes your red dot because you have shake away technology and it's set to nine out of 10 on brightness. You are going to get spidering across your red dot so bad. It is almost impossible to see now on, oh, yeah. the, on the flip side of that. If you're like, well, most bad things happen at night. Like you mentioned earlier, why it's a good idea to have a flashlight. Let me go ahead and keep it at a setting of let's say two out of 10 or three out of 10. But all of a sudden you're leaving Walmart or Sam's club in the middle of the day and, you know, and, and, and crackhead Larry comes out and he's got a knife and you pull out your gun and it's set to a nighttime setting. Now you could barely see the reticle 
Oh yeah. You're screwed. So I highly I recommend auto adjusting. What's the term for it? It's uh, it's God, what is uh, just, I know what it is. I don't know what it's, it's called. It's adaptive though. lighting. It's adaptive, adaptive lighting. Adaptive yeah, that's lighting. That's one of the greatest things ever. The first time I got one, I didn't even realize that it was. And I walked in the room and I was like, my dot just changed. So I put my hand over it and like that. I was like, holy crap, right. this is genius. Right. Absolutely. That's that's a big thing. Uh, I wish the Sealy Cat Pro had the adaptive lighting on it. It has a very good range of nighttime to or even night vision. You can you can run NVs yeah, with it. That's nice. And it's super low illuminated. Um but it doesn't have the 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 adaptive lighting, so I wish it did. I, I, that would be the one thing that I would do. Plus, I would also kind of want to get a enclosed red dot system for my pistol. Yeah, uh, I haven't had issues with the the uh, external emitter, right? But I've heard the enclosed emitter is just. I mean, obviously, it's going to keep crap from getting on it and all that stuff. Absolutely, it's going to keep. But I haven't crap. had an issue yeah. yet, but I could see it happening. Right, and and. One of the things that I did, so I love my SIG P365X macro attack ops. Love that mm. pistol. SIG put a, a cartridge window on the rear portion of the barrel. So if you don't know what that means is... I don't. Um, if you take your pistol from like this angle and look up at it or point the barrel straight up and you're looking where the barrel is exposed in the slide... On the rear portion of the barrel, there's a notch that's cut out that you can see. There's a chain or a cartridge chambered in your in your pistol, so it's, it's oh, it lets you almost like a, a loaded chamber indicator. Yeah. Where you can straight up see it. You can straight up see it, right? It sounds like crap's gonna get in that port, doesn't it's it? It's not. That's not the issue. The crap. Okay. That, so the problem is, is when you run a red dot, <gasps> the port has all the gases being directed straight up into the red dot. So if you have that. After about 50 rounds at the range, you have to wipe off your red dot. So that's one of the reasons why I switched over to a true precision barrel, um, which is an aftermarket is barrel, crazy. and they don't have that window for that particular reason. So interesting. Yeah. yeah. I didn't think about that. Hey, there's a trick for that though, for uh like for my um weapon mounted lights, right? Mm -hmm. So I run it forward. Like in line with this, because when I have a can on there, you get nasty shadow. You know, you have, you're on sensors. Yeah, yeah. So have you heard about the chapstick trick? No. So apparently people put chapstick on, on the on the front of their flashlights. It's about just regular clear chapstick. So when it gets it gets crudded up with um, carbon and stuff, it wipes off easy. It won't it won't actually see uh, adhere to it. Really? Yeah, that's one. Of those, that's those, pretty those, awesome. Uh, that's that's one of sick. My that's favorite slick. life hacks. That's super slick. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> have you seen the the jellyfishes for uh, the the RMRs? No. So yeah, it's 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 essentially it's a clear rubber like thick rubber to go over your rmr and it's clear i have not seen yeah that. and they're and they're fairly cheap they're only like 16 bucks and That's not bad. no i got one of these optic shields for the hollow sun okay it's kind of bulky as you can see yeah 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 but it does give it a pretty good amount of armor because i wasn't it does. Sure how the was so be. this is not going to give any sort of rigidity armor so, like, if you were to drop it against, let's say, a rock, it's not going to necessarily... Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll give it some protection. It's like a phone case, is what it is. Oh, yeah. Just it's like a phone pad. case. But the, the big thing about it is, is it covers the lenses and it covers the emitter. So, oh, no, you, you, yeah, you can use it with it on. That's nice. Right. Now, it's not going to be as good without it on, but you can use it. That's something that I am looking at getting. So... Yeah, and honestly, even if it gets, as you probably know, if you completely cover your red dot, if you're shooting both eyes open, you've still got your red dot. Absolutely. So as long as the back doesn't get completely right. grudded, it's probably fine. So I find with the red dots, I, I like red dots at range, at, out, out beyond 10 yards, but I actually like irons at 10 yards and closer. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. I, I I don't know. It's um. So I've got I've got targets that I shoot. So have you ever seen like circle targets? So it's like rows of circles. Yeah, you know, like steel ones. No, play, on paper. So they'll oh, be. Oh yeah, it's the, like it's like a big printed paper. Just big printed paper. And it's a whole bunch of circles that are about right. like two and a half, three inches wide, and there's yeah, like five that. across and five rows down or six rows down. So like, mm -hmm. what I'll do with with my my pistol is I like to take it to the range, put one of those targets up, and I'll start at like three yards, and then I got to shoot one, two, three, four, five, and get it in every single hole across the top. And I find, and then I'll, after that, I'll move it out to like five yards and then seven yards and then 10 yards and then 15 yards and 20 and then 25. And what I've a really good idea. And, and, and I don't progress to the next distance 
until I can shoot one line straight at that distance with it, with the bullet touching each circle. Um, I like that. And it, it's, it's a, it's a drill. It's a, it's a legitimate drill, but I found that I, I shoot better with that drill with iron. So I like to co-witness irons uh, at from like three to 10 yards. And then after 10, once I get to like 15, 20, 25, I'm using the red dot. Interesting. Now, do you run that with a shot clock or just kind of just, or just running at your own speed? No, I mean, sometimes like I, I've done speed drills before in like older videos and stuff like that. Um, for myself, I'll run some shot clocks sometimes just to see how fast I can actually run. But dude, it's, I'm a bigger guy, like I said, and I, mm -hmm. one video where I ran like speed drills, people just like tore me apart on it. And I was just like, okay, I'm not going to run this on the, on the, uh, let them tear you apart. They're yeah, all caring. It's whatever. You know, I just don't think, I think if people actually met me in person, they wouldn't talk shit. Oh, guaranteed. They're all, they're all the keyboard right. warriors. Yeah. No, I mean like I'm a, I'm a pretty intimidating person in person in like, in person. I'm a bigger guy. Um, and it's just kind of funny, but you know, I've, I've mentioned it before. I, I kind of have a beer gut. I got fat due to COVID and drinking too much beer and, and I'm not tactical looking, right? Like I'm not John Lovell or grand thumb or print shoot repeat. That dude's got a killer body, by the way, that I'm jealous, jealous. Of that. <laughs> um, yeah, but, I'm not in any way in shape. I think if I uh, ran to my mailbox, I might be winning. Yeah, but you, you look good doing it. You're like, what's his name? T-Rex arms. You got like the T-Rex arms build, you know? I hope not that skinny. You're not that skinny, but he... <laughs> Actually, I, I love his channel, though. No offense to him. But yeah, I always say uh, when he when he runs, he, he gets his rifle real high like this when he yeah. runs, you know? I always say he looks like a chicken when he runs. He does. But uh, Lucas, I will say my hat's off to Lucas because I went from like basically wasting ammo for my first eight years of shooting. And then I was working in Ohio on the road building an electrical substation. Bored out of my mind with a pile of guns in a rental house. And I'm like... Oh, look at these training videos, how to train in an indoor range. Mm. So I, I went through all his earlier videos and I, it, it changed my entire style of shooting. Like mm. now I shoot with a helmet, a plate carrier and a full battle belt. Every time I go to the range, right. You're getting and, your practice for what you, you, you need it for, you know? Oh yeah, exactly. Like I'm, I'm practicing for the two gun type stuff. And like that would translate to real life, but mostly I just practice for two guns absolutely but like all all of that came from t-rex arm so i like to make fun of his run but he i learned a lot of crap off that dude trailer. can move it though man that man moves fast oh, he's an incredible shot yeah yeah he, <laughs> he's, yeah, like a, he he's like a sentry gun i know he's he he can move it man and like he runs you know and then he he hits those targets it's really impressive there's a there's an older guy that i used to follow too if you ever get into bolt action stuff and you want to do like long distance stuff he had a series taborosaurus rex I don't know if you've ever watched any of his stuff. No, I have not. So Rex, his real name is Rex Tibor, uh, but he, he goes by Tor Tiborosaurus Rex on That's his funny. channel. And he had a, a whole Sniper 101 series. And if you Ooh. ever want to learn how to shoot long range and on a budget, dude, that, that series is amazing. Is, That's a skill I lack. I don't know how to shoot right. long range. And 500, I've, I'm topped out at 500. Right. And he he taught me, you know, even when I was in the military, I was watching his videos and he taught me major differences between MOA, mil, why one's good for one application, what's, what, what's good for another application. Mm. And then I started really diving into like dirty stuff about how to range using mil reticles and you know how to look at like a human body understand that a human body is normally this tall so if you're looking at a mill reticle through a first plane you should be able to see how like from one mill to another mill how how much is that person's silhouette actually covering if they're standing and then be and able you know to how far away they are that's how far away they are and then it can also translate over into i started translating it into hunting for elk and stuff like that oh, as well nice. elk and deer you could do the same thing so i've got the range finder but it kind of sucks if you're looking through the scope and then all of a sudden this beautiful elk walks out between a click, you know, window inside the brush. And you're like, shit, I need to put my rifle down and put up the range finder. And then when you go oh, to yeah. look, you're, you're searching. And then when you go back to look with your rifle, all of a sudden the elk has moved out of the window. So yep. it's, it's a good skill, but he taught me a lot. So for, uh, for ranging, this is off topic for archery. I take my range finder and I scan a 20 foot sweep, a 20 yard sweep around me memorize the trees 30 yard sweep so i try to remember tears mm -hmm. but going out for a rifle distance out to 200 300 400 yards that wouldn't be happening i'd imagine right yeah it just depends it, it depends on what you're doing like if you're deer hunting you're going to typically be stand hunting you're not really moving much especially with east coast oh, whitetail yeah. 
Um, yep. hundred percent. You know, I mean, it's, it's, that's kind of what you're doing. Um, but with like Rocky mountain elk, you have to move a lot. Very, very rarely. Oh, really? Yeah. Very rarely are you going to be staying stationary for longer than like a couple of hours. Some people might disagree with me, but all that sounds like fun. Actually. Yeah. It's a lot of stock hunting. It's a lot of stocking is the animals and knowing what their patterns are. That's like the big thing with elk hunting out here is you're going to be covering miles in a day hiking, but you need to know what the patterns are of the elk and like, Hey, in the morning, they typically go to like zone a or zone B. And from what I'm seeing, they're, they're 65% more likely to be in zone a than they are in zone B and they're traveling. If, if they go zone a, then, uh, and I don't get one, they're going to be traveling typically to these zones. We'll say zone C and zone Z or zone D. But if they go zone B in the morning, now they're going to be going to zone E or zone F. So you take it and you take a gamble in like in the morning and you're like, okay, I think I'm going to go to zone A this morning because it's 65% chance likely they'll be there, but they don't right. show up. They go to zone B. So now you realize you're past your window time to hunt them in the morning. So now you've got to go back to where they're going to be tracking if they, if they went to zone B in the morning. And so you're doing a lot of movement throughout the That's day. A crazy amount of tracking and, and yeah. stuff like that too. Yeah. To dude, it's, it's, it's one of the, it's one of, it's a great way to stay in shape, especially if you're up at like 10,000 feet altitude. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I do well. Yeah. You, you got to practice for it. You got to practice for it. I'm not oh, I'm sure. like, I try to keep my, my limited like motion to like five miles in a day just because I don't want to. And I try to do like circles and, and from where the elk would probably be type thing, but I don't want to get too right. far out. Um, I've yeah, got, yeah, I've, get them back too. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. And, and like, you're not getting it back in one, one go unless you have a pack mule. So if, oh, right. yeah. And you got a quarter that you can't drag it. It's a monster. Yeah. You got to quarter them, put it on your back, go back to your vehicle, go back to the spot, get the rest, go back. Unless you got a team of people with you. Right. You know? Or some kind of vehicle or something. Right. Yeah. What's, I mean, what's a quarter, what's a quarter of an elk probably weighs? Is it about, it's about like a whitetail, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you're going to be putting about probably anywhere from like 80 to 120 pounds of meat on your back at a time. Yeah. 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 That's like a doe. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Actually, I, uh, my doe I got this year, you know, everyone always has it on the ground. I was like, I'm going to do something different. So I, I yeeted that doe up under my shoulder like this, probably getting ticks and blood running all down my chest. I got a picture with her on my shoulder. I carried her out of the awesome. woods like this. That's She's awesome. a big doe too. Really? I was smiling for the picture, but in real life I was going, ah, I, <laughs> I, was, I was struggling. Oh man, dude. Do you, what, when, so when was your first kill? So three years ago with the bow and arrow? Yeah. For three years ago, I smoked that buck and that was it for that year. Right. Uh, last year, now he was like a, a uh, depending on who you ask, he was either a nine or an 11 pointer. Wow. And then, uh, last year I smoked a big eight and two dough this year. I smoked another big eight and two dough. Right. Wow. Okay. So I'm eating good, eating good venison. Yeah. I, my first year was, I was 10 years old in San Angelo, Texas. Small, oh, that's cool. Small dough. It was like 96 pound, you know, it was a small, small dough, but it tasted delicious. Oh, I'm sure. I was a top tier. Yeah, I was with my dad and my uncle shot it through the spinal column and it paralyzed. That's. Him. That's less fun. Yeah. And then my uncle, because I was like freaking out because it was, it was freaking out. It was luckily like right above the shoulders and the neck. So it didn't, it literally, I shot it and it just went, poof, but it wasn't, oh, it was oh, it, no, it was paralyzed from the neck down. So it oh, wasn't yeah. moving, but its head was like, you're going with the, uh, the yeah. old knife. My, my uncle pulled out the knife and, knife and slit its throat. And I was like, oh, <laughs> 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 I was 10 years old. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's part of it, I guess. That right? is part of it, right? You know, definitely, man. Well, dude, it's thank last, you, la thank yeah, you man. for coming on, man, dude. I, I hope it was a good experience. Um, oh, it was a great experience. You know, I, 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 you're a fun person to talk to. I think you definitely have so much potential with your channel, and it's oh, likewise. It's, it's like just, your channel looks professional. I mean, it's 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 cool. I film everything with the cell phone. Do you know how you do that? You're, I think your uh, your lighting must be good or something. I actually just got these lighting boards for this uh, right. podcast. So, I, so, so like just a little bit of a secret. Not many people know this, but um, back when I was in the military and before the military, so in the late '90s and early 2000s, I did professional photography. So I started oh, off. Did you? I did photography with film. So it was all about lighting, and I did like oh, wow. I did studio photography, and then I did wedding photography and sports photography as well. And then I moved over into digital. 
but because I started out with film in the nineties and the early big money, uh, you, you had to get the shot correct. Right. So it was all about lighting. Mm -hmm. It was all about lighting because if you didn't get the right shot, once you developed the film, the shot was gone. You couldn't go back in and Photoshop film. something. So That's great. And you can't check it right there because it's film. No. And then I switched over to digital in like 2009. I switched to Digi. And I started shooting professional digital photography. And I did uh, like weddings all over the country in like Napa, California. I got flown out to New Hampshire. I did commercial cool. work. I did commercial work for like Universal Studios down in Florida. Um and I was gonna, I was making more money as a professional photographer at the time than I was from the military. And my goal was to get out of the military and become a professional. Yeah, while you were in the military, oh yeah, oh, yeah. You're, you're you're perfectly cut out for a channel photography, hunting, growing up, military. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 dude. But that's where I learned a lot about lighting. Like in downstairs, I literally have like one of those thirty five dollar Amazon light kits that I use for my videos, but. It's just I know how to work it. And the funny thing is, is yeah. I actually have my professional lighting studio downstairs in my remote. Yeah, I have it like downstairs and I don't even bust it out. Yeah, actually, you'd be dying laughing if you saw my actual studio here. The yeah. table in front of me, the table in front of me is pretty funny. I'm not going to lie. Really? Oh, yeah. I have a uh, uh, compound po archery case on top of a rifle case on top of a stool. Oh, that's hilarious. With whole mouse and everything. Well, I, I just moved this house maybe right. four months ago. I haven't fully built the shop out yet. Right. So, so it is you oh, have, it's funny. It looks oh, it's like you up. have a good studio. My mentor keeps telling me that I need a my mentor <laughs> the studio is just in the frame. <laughs> I, yeah, there you go. But it looks good though, because that's like what all the gun tube channels are going to now is like, you know, uh some sort of slat wall in the back with firearms mounted on it. That's like Yeah, every, that seems to be the way. You know, that's that's the way, and I don't have that, so I'm running a different Not yet. I don't know if I will. Uh, I'm right now. I'm 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 filming in front of my huge screen TV downstairs in the basement. Is that what that is? Uh huh. I was I meant to ask you what kind of special effects you got for that acid trip going on in the background. <laughs> that dude's comment was funny because yeah. I was watching a video. I don't even know what you were talking about. I was like, yeah. that's a stinking cool background. All right. Yeah. And that's honestly so, the awesome trick. People will sit there and just daze at it. And, and I've had people <laughs> like leave it. that comment before that I came for the gun review and stayed for the background. You know, the, the you journey. Know, I, I think I saw that. comment. Yeah. The journey through space or whatever. And so. You know, you have to find those little tricks. So it's unique. It's it is unique to your channel. It is unique to my channel, and it keeps it interesting. Um, you know, and it allows you to change up what the background's going to be all the time. So right, right. Yeah, That's you cool. just have to know the trick, like how to actually make that work. So you need a telephoto lens, and the camera's got to be further away from you, so that when it zooms in on you, it oh, actually compresses the image behind you because if i try to use like a one-time zoom or like the equivalent of like a 55 millimeter lens mm -hmm. um i'm gonna get way more of the background beside the television so i have to use a telephoto lens and that's why i use like the high-end samsung ultras because they have four lenses on the back of this yeah and these are all optical zoom lenses so it's all high quality zoom yeah, that's crazy. So I use a telephoto optical zoom on that, and then I can set it up so that I'm, the the TV, you can't see the border of the TV. So it looks like I'm almost green screened in. Yeah, I had no idea how the heck you were doing it. Yeah. Because yeah. So, I've, I've done the green screen stuff. It looks better with what I'm doing now. Oh, it looks incredible. I was like, how on earth is he doing that? Because it looks sweet. Yeah, it's fun. But, so, yeah, man, yeah, if man. you ever, if you want to chit chat or like, we can chat, like, because you've definitely got some angles that I watch with your stuff like the first person shooter stuff that I kind of want to explore. Oh, it's so easy. Well, we'll I don't want to, we'll I don't want to give it. away all the secrets on, you know, through yeah, to, to these people, you know what I mean? We got to get you monetized first. So I do. Yeah, yeah I do. Absolutely. So, but thank hey, you man, for coming yeah. on. Oh, I appreciate you inviting me on. I had a great time. Honestly, I want to get in doing some live streams. Yeah. It'd be fun uh, if I can if I can uh, somehow figure it out. It'd be cool to do this exact same thing. We'll do it on my channel. We'll bring you on as a guest. Absolutely. And I've fun, got right. Yeah, and I've got another guy too that's really good live streaming as well. Austin with um, Reloading Weatherby, super knowledgeable guy. He reloads all of his ammunition, and he's got a bigger channel. Uh, and then I also got Cyclops Joe as well, who's got hundreds of thousands of subscribers, and he's a he's a trip. He's funny unfiltered and he loves midgets so, <laughs> <He doesn't. laughs> yeah no i mean like he loves us and, but he's he's, he's an awesome guy man like i really appreciate him and and 
you know, and like, that's the other thing is as you grow, you're going to find, have you ever heard that saying like, never meet your heroes? Oh yeah. Right. There's, there's going to be some people that you will reach out to when you're trying to grow your channel and they'll be like, Oh, you only have 10,000 subscribers. Yeah. Get back to me when you have over. Yeah. You know, the crazy thing is it's uh, it's funny what you can do. We do need to end cause it is in yeah. fact midnight. midnight, but it, it is crazy what you can do with, with the subscribers we're at here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. But I think the important thing is, is that we're building, if you follow a lot of the channels and you're like, how does this fool have 300,000 subscribers? Like it was almost accidental, but you go to the long form and there's no content. Yeah. I feel like what we're doing is we're playing chess. They're playing checkers. We're building right. a foundation that right. actually give our audience something good. We're giving them right. actual useful information, right. gunsmithing stuff, like good content. Well, I may not be good at producing it sometimes, but good information. Then if we get that just monster of a short that gets millions yeah. of views, they're going to have something to watch when they go to our channel. I think that's, what's going to be important. That's Well, that's a big thing is, you know, um, I, I got really good guidance when I first started. Well, not when I first started out actually in the past year was your channel is too all over the place. And I was like, well, at that time, even though I was like monetized, I was like, well, I really make stuff that I enjoy doing. So I might make something about cooking or drinking or, you know, riding motorcycles or firearms and, you know, or I might make something about hunting or just hiking, you know, it was like all over the place, but I was getting insanely slow growth. And then my mentor is like, do you want a chance to make a living at this? He's like, you have the skills with your footage, you know how to film, you talk well on camera and you, you have a unique style and a unique look. You're not handsome, but you're not ugly, but you have a unique look. And I was like, well, thanks dude. I appreciate it. You know? <laughs> So a nice, you know, so what is a backhanded compliment type thing? Um, he's like, you need to focus. And it wasn't just him. Other people with a lot more subscribers. I, I try to talk to as many people as I can and get as oh, much yeah, same. Uh, input. And they're like, you need to focus in on what is going to make you successful. What is successful on your channel? What makes you successful? They're like, if you still want to make videos that aren't about what your viewers are typically used to seeing, go ahead and make it, but make sure you're unclicking notify my yeah. subscribers. I didn't even know that. That's good to know. That's right. going to be a game changer. That's a big one. That's a big one because if you want to make something that's different, but you're like, I really have a passion about this, or I think there's a group of people out there that aren't necessarily watching me, but would enjoy this, then Go ahead and make it, but make sure you're not pushing out because that's the whole thing why I was asking if you watch the SEO stuff with YouTube because there's a lot of videos that explain. There's this one guy that I love to watch. I can't think of his name right now, um, but he he he's a short little dude, good looking guy, and all he does is just tell you how to be successful on YouTube. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, and, and little brown hair guy. I can't. He's I've subscribed to him. I'm. It's really late here, and I have dad brain. Yeah, and and sorry, but his thing is is like you know, it's you have to make the content for your subscribers. But if you make something that's outside of what your subscribers are seeing, he explains that there's essentially like there's the 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 closed arena, and then there's like the the local arena, and then there's the actual like international arena, and to get your video where out to the international arena, which is where you want it. That's where you're going to get it in front of the most people. You have to get through your, your closed arena, which is going to be a small group of your subscribers first. And then, and that could be a group of like a hundred to like a thousand of your subscribers. And then once, once you hit like a benchmark for that, then they'll push it into the local arena, which will only have like a, a hundred thousand viewers to see how that does. And if it does really well there, then it gets pushed out into like the international arena for entertainment. That's so. interesting. That, if you look at your analytics, it actually makes sense. How, yeah. how the, right. If I can go. find the video where he talked about that, I'll, I'll, I'll email it to you, but it, it was, it, he, he's the one that also helped teach me about don't make content or make content that you don't necessarily make, but don't push it out to your subscribers. Hmm. Got it. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Cause hey man, well, right, man. uh, We'll have to link up again. There's yeah. a lot. Of, there's a, actually, it's funny. We didn't even cover that much. No. <laughs> there's a lot to talk about. Oh, 100%. Yeah, definitely. Good. Uh, we can have more of a guided. I've had more guided stuff, but, you know, I think a yeah, lot of. It's fun to just chill sometimes. I, I work 
Oh, uh, 26 hours in the last two days. Wow, that's a lot. So yeah, you need so, to yeah, I'm down to just chill. Right. Also, too, it was a live stream. And I feel like with the live streams, they need to be less formal than like an actual podcast. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But so. that's cool. All right, man. All right. Talk Very to you later. Well. Bye. Good night.